we are shown a mountain of defeated monsters near which a man is standing. He reasoned that the only way to end a long war was to win it. A monster towered over the man. He thought of the monster that had plunged the world into darkness and taken the lives of his friends. There was a dark aura surrounding the monster. The one who rules all monsters, the queen, he thought. The monster queen was preparing to attack. The man gripped his weapon tightly. In his mind, he apologized to Arden. The monster queen charged at him. There was a huge explosion. The man wondered if he had ever tried to defeat this dreadful queen on earth where he existed. The stranger said that everything now depends on Arden. In the story, it is narrated that a representative of the race of dead souls, Dharma Moore, has passed away. The man tried to dodge the queen's attack. The monster queen hit him with her attack. Arden remembers Reuben's words, telling him that heroes are meant to lead the weaker ones. The story tells us that a representative of the ancient dragon race, Reuben, has passed away. Arden looked angry. With his sword, Arden struck back. The range of its attack was so great that it hit everything that was nearby, except for the monster queen. The queen attacked him again. We were shown Arden's memoir, in which two strangers were identified. In the main character's mind, the thought of Teheran's words popped up. He talked about some things in this world that only come to an end after death. A member of the monster race, Teheran has passed away. Raiden will said that even though his strength was inadequate, he believed that Arden was different from them. A member of the dwarf race, Randenvil, has passed away. The monster queen's attack left a huge mark. She fixed her gaze on him. Arden attacked her from behind. With his attack, he cut off the monster queen's arm. The enraged queen began to cry out in pain. She pierced Arden with her powerful attack. We are again shown the main character's memory of someone. The man said that he knows about the difficulty of believing this, but the position that the queen occupies. A representative of the mythical Kruger race has passed away. The woman said that the queen should know her place and live in silence. She asked if Arden thought so. A member of the long-eared race, Kashu Shu, has passed away. The angry monster queen charged at him. He tried to dodge her attack. Her hand was pointed at Arden's body. The monster queen had a technique in her hand. Their auras glowed with different colors. After the attack of the monster queen, there was a strong explosion, which caused everything to fly in different directions. We are shown a girl who says something to Arden. She told him that even if he was the only one left alive, you were welcome. A member of the fairy race, Alina, she passed away. A strong wind rose on the battlefield, leaving a deep mark from the monster queen's strike. She turned her attention to something. Arden's hand was in front of her. The monster queen stared at her. She was glad of what she saw. Suddenly, Arden appeared on top of her and used his technique to attack the monster queen. He paused, waiting for further action. There were thoughts in his head, memories of his friends before they died. Arden's eyes began to slowly close. If this is the case, then I hope that we will also meet again one day, said an unknown voice. He thought about how he would always be waiting. Arden started to fall. He reflected that even in remorse, when faced with the consequences of his selfishness, he would remember the names of those who had passed all the tests to protect others. Arden was unconscious. Let's call them hunters. It was evening in the city. We are shown excerpts depicting urban life. The guy was trying to call out to Zai. He asked him what he was doing. The guy waved his hand. He added that they will have a meeting soon. Zai informed him that he was just thinking. The guy told him that if Kiritani flew in the clouds, he would be fired quickly. He noted that if the battle is over, they need to get ready for the base. Kiritani turned his gaze to the sky. Around them, people were examining the bodies of monsters. A group of hunters were preparing to attack. One day, monsters appeared in our world. The man charged at the monster. The hunters woke up, gained agility and began to hunt them. The crowd of people looked ahead. Zai reflected that the picture was very different from what it had been in his previous life. The guy examined the monster's body. He stated that he would leave this territory to the Council of Europe. The guy asked him to finish until the captain started scolding them again. Kiritani heard his request. We are shown a disgruntled Captain Zai. He asked if they were of any use at all. The captain told them not to waste his time, otherwise they wouldn't get the money. Tom and Dai is the captain of the first assault team in the Brave Guild. The subordinates continued their work. They apologized to him and said they would hurry. And in this world, the enraged captain called his subordinates pathetic worms. Kiritani took out a gemstone from the monster. Sai thought that in this world, he was barely able to beat the monsters of even the easiest dungeon. He considered himself weak. The sun was just rising in the city. The main character was heading forward. Sai was running somewhere. He was thinking that this was a good time for morning hunters. The sun was slowly beginning to rise. Today we will quickly get acquainted with the abilities of hunters. Abilities are a form of superpower. An awakened hunter is considered someone who is able to reach his full potential. The conditions for unlocking this very potential are still being investigated, 
and therefore the investigation continues. I have to reach my hunting potential. The main character thought that despite retaining the memory from his previous life, he couldn't use mana. Zai stopped to catch his breath. He knew that his mind and body remembered everything down to the smallest detail. Kiritani reflected that even if he could remember how to swim, the skill was useless without water. Zai adjusted his hood. He believed that in his case, the reason why he continued training day after day was because it was something he was used to doing in his previous life. Kiritani was holding a branch. Zai thought it was time to try it out. Kiritani remembered that in the hunter world, strength was determined by status. The main character tried to concentrate. Zai believed that if he continued to train, all the work would be meaningless. Kiritani was ready to start training. He started practicing his branch strikes. Zai reflected on the life he had lived as a knight. He didn't want to forget it even if he was the only one who remembered it. A Kiritani branch broke on a tree stump. Splinters of wood flew everywhere. Zai realized that someone was trying to call out to him. A young man was standing in front of him. He asked Kiritani if he was training again. The boys sat down on a bench. Zai said it was true. With a smile on his face, the young man said that watching Zai practice every day was both expected and unlike him. He noticed that Kiritani always had such a philosophical expression on her face. The main character was looking ahead. He said it wasn't. They were in the park. The young man noted that he should find a better place to train. He thought Kiritani might be put on the internet. With a smirk on his face, the youth asked if Zai would like to become a hunter. Kiritani said that you can't become a hunter just because you want to. We are shown the morning park. Zai noted that the young man was right. The main character said that he wants to awaken. He talked about how he wanted to become a hunter and earn a lot of money. Everyone wants to become a hunter, with an annual salary of more than a couple of billion, with admiration from the opposite sex. Stand on the front line to face the unknown. The world really needs them. The youth ruffled Zai's hair. He thought Kiritani would be able to do it when he was older. The smiling young man said that people who have something to protect always need money. Kiritani listened in frustration. Zai thought about his words, which said, people who have something to protect the guys went somewhere. Come to think of it, the schedule for clearing the next dungeon will be released tomorrow, right? What is it? The young man asked. He hoped that they wouldn't have to go into two dangerous areas. Sai agreed with him. The captain said that the dungeon they will be clearing this time is the Labyrinth of Raymer. People were surprised by what they heard. The captain said that he would send the details to the post office. The boy, taken aback, tried to say something to him. He had heard that it was a very dangerous place even among rank C dungeons. The guy told them that he had heard about a certain guild that had already gone there, the guys came back very beaten up. The young man told the captain that this was too much for them, as they had only recently learned how to deal with D-rank zones. He repeated that it was too much for them. The captain put his hand to his face. He asked them to shut their mouths and listen to him. The captain told them not to compare themselves to hunters. He added that if they are paid for it, they should do their job without whining. The captain asked them not to act like their opinion mattered. Zai's face showed excitement. The young man noted that it was possible to remind him of this mildly. Isn't the time to renew contracts soon? What is it? He asked. The captain shoved his hands in his pockets. He said that if someone got scared, they can leave. The captain added that trust is the most valuable thing in this niche. He said that people who left before the contract expired would not be able to work anywhere else. With a smirk on his face, the captain noted that even without him saying anything, the rumors were spreading. The main character sighed. The enraged captain asked who had just sighed. He asked Kiritani if it was him. Zai said it was him. Enraged, the captain grabbed Zai's shirt. He asked Kiritani how much more time he needed to remind him to watch his manners. The captain ordered Zai not to act like he was special here. The young man informed the captain that he would participate in the cleanup. A drooping Ren said that he would participate. He asked the captain to stop. Ren asked if the captain would like to avoid rumors before the sweep begins. The captain turned his attention to him. The boys laughed at Ren's words. Well, if Ren says he's going, the laughing guy would say. The stranger noted that no matter where they went, there was no difference. The laughing man added that since the hunters will be there, then everything will go smoothly. The captain thought they were pathetic worms. He reflected that if they were bent down by such pressure, they might just follow the instructions with their mouths shut. The captain started to leave the room. He ordered the guys to do everything normally. The captain said he would wait. Taken aback, Ren said they had to go. The plot takes us to the next day. The captain and the boys were standing in front of the portal. The captain said that they needed to warm up before cleaning up. He was standing right in front of the portal entrance. The captain called Hyde and Claude, who informed them that they were going to the front lines. Then, he called Akashi, and the captain said that he would keep them at a distance. The captain pointed out that the magic support group should always be ready to attack. Kiritani thought that everyone looked worried. He knew the hunters didn't like the cleanup, but they were forced to, too. The hunters entered the portal. 
The captain said that the pathetic worms do not get in the way of hunters. The boys watched as the hunters entered the portal. An excited Ren announced that they would be leaving soon. Sai could feel the tension in the air. The main character entered the portal. Kiritani hoped that this would not be his first step towards death. Brave Guild is the first D-rank assault team. Level C Dungeon, Raymer's Labyrinth. The sweep has begun. The stranger stepped into the water. Entrance to the Labyrinth of Raymer. The captain led the hunters through the dungeon. The guy turned to Sheeta. He asked her if she had a strange feeling. She crossed her arms. Sheeta noticed that it didn't look like what she had heard, and she wondered if she should report it to the captain. The boy raised a finger to his mouth. He told Sheeta that it was just a harmless C-rank dungeon. The guy was confident that they could handle it. He added that Karin hadn't been in the best of moods lately, and the guy thought it was better not to bother him. The hunters were moving forward. Ren noticed that they were acting a little scary. Sai agreed with him, he thought something was bothering them. Kiritani thought that the dungeon was different from what they expected. There was a commotion in the dungeon. Because of this, the guys were scared. The captain raised his sword above his head, telling everyone to stop. Deep in the darkness, a sound could be heard. A monster emerged from it. Behind the monster was an immeasurable number of them. The captain reported that the monsters were attacking. Hey, don't you think this is too much already from the beginning? What is it? The frightened guy asked. The stranger thought it was suspicious. The captain charged. He told the hunters not to stand still if they wanted money. The young man attacked the monster. He noted that although there are a lot of them, they are just bugs. The young man cut down the monster. The captain ordered the tanks to attack. The boys rushed at them. There was a fierce battle going on between the hunters and the bug monsters. Ren informed Zai that they should stand at the exit. He asked him to stay close. The bug monster moved into battle. He started to roar. The bug monsters became more and more numerous. A group of hunters were trying to call out to the tanks. The guys noted that there are too many of them. The girl loaded the bow with a fire arrow. She ordered everyone to disperse. The girl shot a bow, and then there was a strong explosion. Ren and Kiritani tried to hide from the shock wave. The man asked if it was all over. The captain ordered them not to stand like idols. He stated that the average boss is coming out. We were shown Galas, the middle boss of the Limmer Maze. The captain told the hunters to avoid his tail and aim for his head. He added that everyone is on their own here. Galas made an attack with his tail. It hit several hunters. The middle boss jumped up. The captain ordered to dodge his attacks. He asked if the mage army was here. The mages started casting spells. They noted that they had completed their training. The magicians asked them to stop yelling at them and get out of the way. They added that the hunters should not attack the shell as they are going to shoot at it. The mages attacked Gaulas. The middle boss was hit with a series of attacks. The explosions caused dust to rise in the dungeon. The wizard asked if they had killed Gaulas. The captain ordered them to collect everything they found valuable. The hunters set to work. The guy tried to cut through the middle boss carapace. He didn't understand why his armor was so strong. The guy turned his attention to the fact that the middle boss was still alive. Gaulas hit him with venomous saliva. The hunter was defeated. Its venom spread all over the dungeon. The stranger noted that no one had told them that the middle boss had poisonous saliva. The young man ordered all the participants to retreat. He added that they can die if they touch this liquid. The young man was standing behind a stone blockage. He ordered the first troops to quickly retreat. Even the fumes from the poison were dangerous, he noted. He was amazed that the hunters were required to know all about such things before they arrived. Sai tightened his grip on the strap of his backpack. Kiritani thought that something was definitely wrong here. The captain of the squad was standing with a sword in his hands. He didn't understand what the hunters were doing. The captain said that now was not the time for them to be lazy. The captain noted that this problem is easy to deal with if you close the monster's mouth. Sai guessed that even the hubbub shuddered. Poison sprays flew towards the hunters. The hubbub called the hunters pathetic worms. The captain charged at the monster. He ordered them to move on while he dealt with him. The hubbub kicked off from the ground. The captain swung his sword to stab the monster. Gom cut off his head. The hunters were glad of Gomen's victory. They noted that the captain was different from the rank of C. Gomen ordered them not to stand still and not be lazy. The hunters were exploring the dungeon grounds. The guy said that while they had time, they should check the supplies and examine the wounded. The silhouette of a monster appeared from the shadows of the dungeon. The captain and the hunters were very frightened. The monster flapped its wing. The hunters couldn't believe it. The monster was standing right in front of them. He was surprised that they had just defeated the middle boss. Startled, Ren swung his sword. He ordered Zai to back off. Ren held his sword to Kiritani's throat. He told him that if Zai wanted to leave, then let him go alone. Ren ordered them to stay out of his way. Kiritani was holding onto his sword, blood dripping down his arms. Ren claimed it was all his money. He tried to kill Kiritani. Kiritani asked him to calm down. The hunter held on tightly to his sword. Ren pointed out that for the sake of his little sister, 
He needed money. He added that his precious little sister was ill. Ren's face was full of fright and anger. He said that he needed money to cure his sister. Ren kept shouting. He didn't understand why he couldn't be a hunter. Ren couldn't understand why his little sister had to suffer so much. The sun was shining in the dungeon. Ren talked about wanting to live happily with his little sister. He wanted her to be happy. There was blood on Zai's face. Kiritani let go of the sword. Ren stuck his sword into the ground. Small rocks rained down around her. Ren held onto his sword. Zai told him that everything was fine. Kiritani placed his hand on Ren's arm. He told him that everything was fine. Tears welled up on Ren's face. Kiritani informed him that if Ren left here, he would be able to see his sister. Tears welled up in Ren's eyes. He said what he did to Zai was wrong. Kiritani got up from the floor. Zai asked Ren to calm down because Snai was already fine. Kiritani took Ren by the shoulder. Ren agreed with Zai. Kiritani told them to hurry. Ren's face was troubled. Zai didn't understand what had happened. He thought Ren was still under the influence. Suddenly, something attacked Ren from behind. He gripped the sword tighter. Zai saw blood splattering around Rin. Zai's friend was defeated. Kiritani didn't understand what was going on. Zai was very scared. Ren's mouth was bleeding. Kiritani tried to catch him. A bloodied Ren said that he was glad that Zai was okay. Kiritani's eyes were filled with horror. The captain asked where they were going. Gaman had a smirk on his face. Isn't the concert already over? What is it? The captain asked. There was a monster feather on his shoulder. Zai remembered something. A memory of the murdered girl appeared in his mind. Kiritani was shocked. Ren was lying in a pool of blood. Sho reflected that when he heard that Ren had someone to protect, Kiritani thought it was just the words of an idealist. In his memories, Ren stroked his head. Zai thought that Ren was overplaying and his words were empty. He thought that he knew better. Kiritani recalled his past life. Zai's shoes were covered in blood. Kiritani thought that Ren had died protecting him. If he hadn't paid attention to his words, then Ren's death was in vain. Zai took the two swords in his hands. Kiritani was looking in the captain's direction. The hubbub mocked him. There was barely any wind in the dungeon. Gaman had a smirk on his face. He asked Wu Zai if he would be the pitiful worm that fights with two swords. Sorry to disappoint, but you're not in the game, said the captain. Zai was ready to attack him. He was thinking that he needed to make sure of something. Kiritani's eyes were full of anger. He was thinking that the C rank hunter would die today. A monster was flying over the hunters. Gaman was thinking that the dungeon cleanup had failed. The captain was watching the monster. He knew that the team had crumbled and the hunters had been destroyed. There was anger on his face. The captain didn't understand why something like this had happened. Gaman gritted his teeth. He didn't think it was his fault because he was always right. The captain was watching the squad. Gaman thought it was their fault. The captain held a monster feather in his hand. He thought that those pathetic worms had interfered with the hunters. There was a strange smile on his face as he continued to stare at the feather. He believed that the squad had no right to exist. The captain attacked one of the squad members. He thought that they would pay him in full for losing. The frenzied hubbub continued to kill them. The captain ran his sword through the youth. He was under the influence of the monster's technique. The captain considered them useless worms. Zai tried to get up from the ground. A gloating smile spread across Gaman's face. He thought that Kiritani would also catch up with them. Gaman thought that Zai was an impudent, annoying, and pathetic worm. The captain charged. There were blood splatters everywhere. He impaled Ren with his sword. The hubbub began to laugh. The captain thought that Zai would shudder and be afraid of death. Kiritani held his swords and was ready for his attack. The captain assumed that even Zai had the guts. Gaman pointed his sword at Kiritani. He asked him what he was doing. Don't tell me you're going to fight. Continued the hubbub. The captain said that there was a big difference in status between them. There were traces of blood on the captain. He talked about being a hunter and having abilities, but the captain didn't know what to take with her. Gaman noted that Kiritani was still too young to even wake up. He pointed his sword at Zai. Gaumon said he would cut out his eyes first. The captain didn't know where Kiritani had gone. Zai attacked him from behind. The hubbub was taken aback. He grabbed his shield. The captain blocked Kiritani's attack. Gaumon swung his sword. He added that he hadn't finished speaking yet. The captain attacked Zai. The main character jumped back. He was thinking that he could move. Kiritani thought that even if his opponent had lost his mind, he should not forget that he was a hunter. Zai was struck by its extraordinary power. His gaze was directed at the captain, who was holding his sword. He thought of him as a hunter, rotten though he was. Let's see how regular training has helped you, Zai continued to think. The main character understood that the only thing that was dangerous right now was Ramara, who was watching the situation from the side. Kiritani thought about how he needed to focus on the hunter right now. Zai rushed at the hubbub. The captain blocked his attack. The hubbub struck back. The captain's sword grazed Zai a little. Kiritani dodged his next attack. The main character stepped back a little. Kiritani was cornered. The wind blew her hair back. 
He knew he was weaker anyway. The main character thought that his brain was telling him to dodge attacks, but his body couldn't keep up. Zai crossed his swords. If I could use 5%, not if I could use even 1% of my powers from my previous life, Zai reasoned. The captain called Kiritani. Gaman couldn't believe that Zai was moving so well. Kiritani had a smirk on her face. The main character thought that the captain was worried when he realized that the situation was not so predictable. Zai suggested that he was wasting a lot of time trying to develop a strategy. Kiritani raised his swords. He asked if Gaman needed someone to teach him how to breathe. The enraged captain ordered him to be quiet. Gaman created a blast wave with his sword. His technique moved towards Kiritani. Zai blocked it. Cuts appeared all over the main character's body. He stepped back. Zai swung his sword. He was almost able to hit the captain. An incision appeared on Gaman's neck. The main character thought that he had made a terrible attack. Zai thought about how he needed to continue like this. Kiritani landed many punches on the captain's body. Gaman was shocked by this. He had to retreat. There was blood on the captain's face. He didn't understand what was going on here. Gaman's entire body was covered in cuts. He couldn't believe that he would lose to Zai. The bloodied captain screamed. Gaman said it couldn't be. The captain charged. He activated many of his techniques. The hubbub headed towards Kiritani. The main character knew that he was attacking him. Zai reflected that the captain had used up all of his abilities and was now moving so fast that his eyes couldn't keep up. Kiritani noted that the direction of Gaman's movements is easy to predict. Zai closed his eyes. He felt that this was the wrong way to use abilities. Kiritani launched his attack. Zai continued running towards the captain with his eyes closed. He was thinking that Gaman's trajectory was too obvious. The captain tried to strike with his sword. With his eyes closed, Kiritani dodged his attack. Zai held the sword in his hand. Kiritani struck back. Gaman's sword was broken. The main character opened his eyes. The captain's foot flew out of the way. Blood began to pour from the captain's body. Zai watched him. The hubbub called her a rat. You think you'll get off so easily? Oh, he cried. There was a wound on Zai's face. The main character informed the captain that those feathers quite convincingly help a person lose their mind. He asked Gaumont if he had regained his sanity before he died. Ren's body lay beside them. Zai pointed out that otherwise, he was sure that the captain deserved to die. The bloodied captain was taken aback. He thought Kiritani's words were nonsense. The hubbub spoke of being a hunter. The captain couldn't understand how Zai, who hadn't even woken up, was doing. The main character ordered him to die. Zai cut off the captain's head. Gaman's head fell to the ground at Zai's feet. Kiritani lowered his head. He was struck by complete annihilation. Zai thought about how he hadn't seen so many corpses in a long time. There were many dead hunters lying around him. Kiritani reasoned that it was because he had spent the last few hundred years of his previous life alone. Zai's body was covered in an aura of mana. The main character didn't understand what it was. Kiritani assumed that this was due to what he thought about his previous life. He thought that he could sense something similar to magic power. The main character's body continued to glow due to the aura. Zai assumed that the feeling of magical power when holding a sword was the same awakening. A screen appeared in front of him. It indicated that the sea level had increased. Kiritani was amazed that he had actually awakened. Zai was surprised by the number of stats. His gaze was directed at the hangman's point. Kiritani didn't think it was quite right for him. The main character remembered Ren. He continued to stare at the screen. He found it ironic that those who really needed it had lost their chance, and someone like him had awakened. Zai heard the monster's cry. The monster soared above him. Kiritani noted that it was noisy. The main character decided to test his magic quotient. The screen showed that he had added one level. The monster continued to hover over Zai. Kiritani thought that the difference was only one factor. The main character noted that zero magic and magic with one coefficient felt like heaven and earth. Zai reflected that he wasn't the same person he was before. Mana swirled around Kiritani's body. Zai thought about how he had always wondered why Mana worked like this in this world. A monster was flying over Zai. Kiritani thought that here it was possible to simply release it without any control. Zai noted that the joy of waking up simply blurs the hunter's eyes. The monster charged at Kiritani. The main character believed that because of this, hunters succumb to vanity. Zai thought about it. He assumed that the basic mana usage was similar to a roll. Kiritani thought that it strengthened the body with a delicate control. Zai tossed up one of his swords. He reasoned about finding all the vulnerabilities and connecting all the lines together. Kiritani took a step back. Zai prepared to attack. The main character reasoned that this should be done in order to find an unprotected place to strike. Zai threw his sword at the monster. It flew past him. Kiritani hit a part of the monster's face. The sword slammed into the wall. The monster screamed in pain. Satisfied, Kiritani ordered him to be quiet. The main character activated his mana streams. He wanted to strike at the monster's wing. Kiritani leapt to attack him. 
he noted that death always comes unexpectedly. Zai chopped off the monster's wing. The monster let out a strong roar. Kiritani pushed off the wall for another attack. He tried to concentrate the mana in his hand. Zai thought about how he needed to focus. Kiritani understood that he needed to gather all the mana in his body to explode it. The main character pointed his sword at the monster. Zai thought about making it explode. There was an explosion in the dungeon. Kiritani attacked the monster. He cut his body into two pieces. The monster collapsed to the ground. Behind Zai, the monster lay slain. Kiritani turned his attention to his dead comrades. Then, he looked at the monster again. Zai started to fall. He realized that he had overdone it. Disasters were sent by the queen. They have come to destroy our world, Eslin. The nine races of the Eslin continent had put forward their representatives to fight together and face the unknown enemy head on. Although the enemy was incredibly strong, the nine races met them with determination after going through many terrifying battles. After all, after all the battles, they finally won. The stranger asked her what kind of future she had dreamed of. Poor, pathetic Arden, he continued. Arden didn't understand what was happening. He was confident that he had defeated him. Arden asked Alina to run. The stranger asked where to run. He informed him that all the stars in the sky had gone out. The stranger noted that he was still clinging to hope. He asked Arden to memorize it. The stranger said that all this happened only through the fault of Aiden. And the darkness of your sins will continue to burn you from the inside out in the next life, he added. Zai opened his eyes. The main character was in bed. Kiritani tried to stand up. The man was glad that he was finally awake. Zai turned his gaze to him. He put the tea down on the saucer. The man told Kiritani that he had been asleep for three days. Zai was taken aback. The man handed him his business card. He asked Kiritani not to be afraid of him. The man was standing in front of Zai's bed. The main character asked what had happened to the others. The man put the card on the bed. How fair of you, even though you're a novice, he replied. The man noted that the first thing Kiritani thinks about is his comrades as soon as he wakes up. He informed him that the first armed brigade of the Bold Guild had been completely destroyed. The man said that everyone, including the captain, was dead when paramedics arrived, noting that Zai was the only survivor. Kiritani had a band-aid on her face. Sho asked what had become of the man named Igawa Ren. The man was standing in front of Kiritani, who was lying on the bed. He told him that they had decided to hold the funeral of the deceased in the main building of the hunters. The man added that everything happened while Zai was in a coma. He asked Kiritani to let him move on to the main topic. There was an IV beside Zai's bed. I'm sure you've already figured out that Raymer's labyrinth is ranked B, the man was saying. He asked Zai what he thought about the event. We were shown how the hubbub led a group of hunters. The man claimed that the guild had only just reached rank D and considered this dungeon too difficult, but Captain Gauman had been getting more and more unlucky lately. The main character sharpened his gaze. Zai said he didn't know anything about it. He asked the man what he meant when he said more and more. The man closed his eyes. He assumed that Kiritani had not been informed. The man felt that the hubbub probably did not tell anyone about this. The main character's eye glowed with mana. The man told him that Gauman had a lot of debts due to his love of gambling. He added that this is why the captain went to clean up, despite the fact that he knew about the unbearable complexity of the dungeon. Zai thought the hubbub was a pathetic worm. Kiritani clutched a piece of blanket in his hand. The man suggested that the unexpected changes in the dungeon might be true. It was snowing outside. The man stated that they are still investigating anomalous phenomena in the dungeons. He asked Zai to contact him again if he remembered anything else. Kiritani placed a hand on his forehead. Zai held his head. He was thinking about Ren's death and the disgusting hubbub of going to clean up, just as he was thinking about Ren's awakening. Kiritani picked up the remote to turn on the TV. The news anchor reported that it was time for I want to be a hunter. The host was holding a microphone. He wanted to introduce the guests of today's episode to the audience. The host noted that she is quite a famous person. He hoped that everyone was looking forward to this episode. The host said that he was an SS hunter, nicknamed Odin's Justice, the best hunter in Japan and the second master of the murderous guild. He introduced Aoki to Sora. We were shown the same hunter. The host stated that during her awakening, she received four abilities. He noted that this happens very rarely. The host asked Aoki to pass. Kiritani held the remote in his hands. Sho was thinking of Japan's best hunter, Aoki Sora. The main character reflected that she was more popular than some stars. Kiritani turned his gaze to the screen with his abilities. He reasoned that if she was SS ranked, then he was. Sai opened the list of abilities. Kiritani's abilities were shown on the screen, and it said that he was an executioner. Zai suggested that critics include all evil people. Kiritani assumed that he had awakened when Gaman died. Zai typed in the hangman ability on his phone. He only cared about the question of who was the evil person. Kiritani's gaze was directed downwards. Zai realized that this wasn't just a rare ability, but an ability that only he alone possessed. 
the main character said that if there was a serial killer nearby, it would be possible to test the ability in action. Kiritani continued to search his phone. Sai thought that his E-rank was more important right now. In Kiritani's mind, a memory of his previous life where he was standing next to a girl popped up. Sai thought about it. It was night outside. The main character went to the reception. He was near the doctor. The doctor said that the tests were completed for this. She asked him to take care of himself. Kiritani headed for the exit. A portal opened in the city. Sai thought that everything in his life was meaningless. The main character was talking about hunters who can't use their full strength. He was thinking about the relationship between mana and abilities. Kiritani landed on the ground. Zai thought about how he didn't have anything special in this life. Lightning sparkled near Kiritani. He thought it was pointless. A portal was opened in front of her. Kiritani started to enter it. The main character was confident in his actions. The eyes of the monsters could be seen in the shadows of the bushes. The main character thought that he got a chance to correct the mistakes made earlier. He swore that the tragedy that had happened to him would never happen again in this lifetime. Sai was standing in front of a crowd of monsters. It was foggy outside. Kiritani knew that the only thing he could do right now was to set a priority task. Kiritani's sword was pointed towards the monsters. They began to surround Kiritani. The main character thought that he decided to become the best. The plot takes us to the hospital. The action takes place in the rehabilitation room. The doctor pulled back the curtain. She said that this was the end of her treatment. The doctor added that another patient was already waiting for their turn, and the doctor asked them to look at their feet when the patient left the room. The patient was lying in his bed. The doctor was glad that they had a filtration cube to treat the patient. The girl asked if it was okay that she was unaccompanied. The doctor was standing by the window. She asked the girl if her parents had come. The girl said no. The woman was standing behind the doctor. Irigawa Iri, right. What is it? The doctor asked. She noted that in the last incident she was. The woman turned to Kimura. She said that she would continue to do everything herself. She asked to help others. The woman put her hand on her head. Kimura said she was happy to work with her. The woman asked Iri to forgive Kimura. She noted that she was sometimes too direct. Iri was sitting up in her bed. Igawa thanked her. There was excitement in Mizuhara's eyes. She asked Iri if she but her brother had heard. Mitsuhara leaned over to Iri. Igawa turned to her. The sun was shining brightly outside. Iri said she wanted something sweet to eat. Igawa was in a place where everything was covered in a blue aura. She was thinking about being allergic to mana. Iri held onto her heart. She was thinking that due to the appearance of gates all over the world, they had started to fill the atmosphere with mana. Iri reasoned that it had created a new disease. Igawa knew that she was slowly losing her life to the disease, and eventually you would die. Iri was holding a glass. Igawa thought that this disease was considered incurable, and at the moment there was no way to treat it. Igawa set the glass down on the tray. She knew that the only thing that could be done in hospitals right now was to suppress the symptoms with a filter cube. Igawa's eyes were fixed on the cube. Iri remembered what the doctor had said about her treatment. Igawa looked down at her hand. Iri glanced at the TV where the program was playing. The host said that the last broadcast on television became a huge sensation on the internet. He was talking about number one in Japan. The host named the SS class hunter, Aoki Sora. Aoki showed off her abilities. A burst of mana was coming out of her hand. Sora pointed her weapon forward. Migawa said that no matter how much she watched this video, she was still amazed by her powers. Iri suggested that the rating of these shots breaks all records. Iri half rose from the bed. A guy appeared behind her. He was glad to see Aoki Sora. The guy had a smile on his face. He was struck by Aoki's lightning bolts. The guy said that if he ever wakes up, he will definitely join her guild. Iri thought he had a couple more years before becoming a hunter. The guy was standing in front of Igawa's bed. He asked her if she thought Aoki was cool. The guy was talking about what he heard when Sora woke up, she had as many as four abilities. A smile spread across Iri's face. The guy asked her what she thought of Aoki. He thought she was awesome. Igawa was sitting up in her bed. She agreed with him and said that Sora was cool. The woman took the guy by the shoulders. She asked him why he was wandering around alone again. The woman apologized to Iri. Igawa said it was fine. A soda can fell out of the vending machine. Iri was standing in front of the vending machine. Igawa thought that even though she was the same age as her, Aoki Sora was now the first hunter in Japan. Igawa turned her gaze to the people who were passing by. She thought that Sora was very different from her. A girl who can't even adapt to this world, Iri continued to think. Igawa's hair fluttered in the wind. Iri reflected that when her parents died, her brother took care of her, but because of her body, she became a burden to him. Her tears began to drip onto the soda. Iri started to wipe away her tears. She thought about how much she missed her brother. Mitsuhara slammed her kin against Igawa's. She noted that if Iri were to cry here, she would definitely be noticed. Igawa stopped crying. In front of her was a smiling Mitsuhara who was holding a soda can. 
She added that when it is difficult for her, you need to smile. Mizuhara was sure that Iri's brother would have wanted the same thing. Outside the window was a view of the city. Mitsuhara said that Igawa should be getting better soon, so she would also enjoy life for her brother. Mitsuhara was holding onto the windowsill. She was sure that brother Iri felt the same way and had prepared a gift for her. Igawa smiled. She thanked Mitsuhara. Iri turned her gaze to her. Mitsuhara was looking at something. The moon glowed a strange color. Mizuhara didn't understand why the moon appeared in broad daylight. The man told them to run away immediately. They saw people leaving the hospital. Iri didn't understand what was going on. The man told them to move. Igawa was holding her hair. The man ordered everyone to quickly go for cover. The moon continued to glow a strange color. He added that this is a disaster of division. People started running out of the hospital. The man reported that they had just received a message from the Hunter Association. He pointed out that they needed to run before it got worse. Mizuhara said she didn't see any monsters. The ground began to shake. The man told everyone to run to building B. He asked them to hurry up. Behind Iri, the monster smashed its arm through the window. Igawa looked at his hand. In front of her was a huge monster. Iri was very scared. Mitsuhara asked her to run away. Igawa's legs were shaking violently. She knew that even though she had to run, her legs were still moving. The monster let out a roar. Mizuhara grabbed Iri. She pulled her away from the monster. Mitsuhara asked Igawa to pull himself together because they had to run to the corridor. There was a great deal of excitement on her face. Mizuhara was saying that the association was already aware of what was happening, so the hunters would be here soon. Iri released Mizuhara's hand. She said that she would try to buy some time. Mitsuhara flew away from her. Igawa reflected that he couldn't let her risk her life. Iri didn't want anyone to sacrifice their life for her again. The man was holding Mitsuhara. He informed her that they would not save Igawa. The man asked her to stop. The monster tried to grab Iri. Igawa wondered if anything would have changed if she had the same powers. Kiritani was behind the falling Iri. Igawa opened her eyes. Zai asked her to think about who she was going to leave behind. All around Iri were dead monsters. Igawa Iri, it's you, right? Zai asked. The main character put his sword on his shoulder. He claimed to be here instead of her brother. Igawa was shocked. The main character said that he is Kiritani Sho. Zai added that Iri's brother sacrificed his life for him. Igawa was surprised by his words. A memory of Ren popped into her mind. Iri was sitting across from Kiritani. Igawa realized that she had found the gift her brother had left her. A high-ranking dungeon in the Dortholimian desert. The moon rose outside. Ayaki was preparing to attack. Next to her were two monsters that let out a roar. Sora pointed her sword at them. Ayaki attacked the monster. Sora jumped away from them. The monsters were waiting for further action. She prepared to attack again. Aoki threw a punch at the monster. Oh, the lawyer who previously contacted Sora. What is it? The man asked. Aoki launched a devastating attack on the monster. The monster fell to the ground. The man said that to be more precise, a member of her family was a lawyer. He added that the man himself is an rank hunter. There were hunters in front of us. Kaido Riku was surprised that he was trying to get close to Sora. Ebera Yumi noted that in the end, his phone ended up in the trash. Kaido was leaning on a rock. Riku mentioned that Sora has a lot of fans. Ebera found this obvious. Aoki raised her sword above her head. Sora attacked the monster. Iri pointed out that Aoki is the only SS-ranked hunter in Japan. Sora's hair fluttered in the wind. She was surrounded by a crowd of monsters. Aoki thought that was a good thing. Very good, Sora continued, please. There was a huge explosion in the dungeon. Riku thought that was why Aoki worked so hard today. Kaido looked ahead. In front of them was the Dortholimian dungeon boss. Riku was surprised that the boss appeared so quickly today. He assumed that all of his subordinates had been killed. Kaido began to adjust his weapons. Riku thought it was time for them to get to work. He paid attention to Aoki's words. Sora said that she would do everything herself. Kaido was taken aback. Aoki dodged the boss's attack. Sora was talking about how she originally intended to deal with him alone. Dortholmus let out a great roar. Sora lunged at the boss. Then have fun, Aju, Riku said. Eberu noted that she had asked Riku not to call Aoki that. Sora's technique emitted lightning. With her technique, Aoki hit the boss. He collapsed to the ground. Sora prepared for the next attack. Aoki raised her sword above her head. She stated that there was no point in the boss escaping. Sora stabbed him with her weapon. Lightning sparkled around her. Dust rose around the hunters. Riku pointed out that he should thank that a rank hunter for that. Yumi said that she would have dealt with the boss herself. Aoki was notified that the dungeon had been cleared. She thanked for the work done. He asked her if she was going back. Master, I think she heard everything, Yumi said. Riku asked if she was sure. The creature opened its eye. The ground began to shake violently. Let's discuss this when we get back, Sora said. Aoki was wary. The hunters were confused. 
Ebera didn't understand what was going on here. Yumi noted that they had already eliminated the boss, she didn't understand why there was a rift. Riku asked her to take a look. In front of them was the dungeon core. Kaido was holding his own weapon. Eberu thought that the core should appear somewhere in the depths of the dungeon. Riku noted that anomalies always come unexpectedly. He aimed his gun at the core. Kaido fired a shot. The projectile flew towards the core. It almost caught up with him. Riku's screen showed that the effective range of the shot was four and a half kilometers. Also, it said that the maximum distance is seven kilometers. He saw that the distance to the target was 12 kilometers. Kaido realized that it was too far away from him. Aoki turned her gaze to the core. She asked what was the distance to the goal. Riku said the distance was about 12 kilometers. Dust formed around them. He added that long-range attacks are useless here. Kaido said that regardless of the attack, such a target cannot be reached at such a long distance. Riku noted that they are already delayed on schedule. Sora was looking up. She suggested changing their location. Aoki noted that a rift will occur soon. Kaido agreed with her words. The hunters opened a portal to another world. Riku stated that the gate to another dimension had opened. He assumed that the breakup had already begun. Kaido added that they didn't have time to think. The hunters jumped into the portal. Sora reported that she had already contacted the guild. She asked me to focus on the rescue mission. Riku listened to her order. The core of the dungeon appeared in the city. Kaido asked what Aoki would do. She said it was obvious. Sora headed off. Aoki announced that she would bring the moon down to Earth. A reporter interviewed a man amid the explosions. He informed the man that a rift had appeared over Setagaya Prefecture. The reporter noted that this is a threat to the life of the S rank. He asked the expert if there were any rifts in the dungeons. The expert said that the reporter is absolutely right. The expert added that the rift is usually more complex than the dungeon in which it occurs. Doctors carried the injured out of the hospital. The expert assumed that judging by the size of the rift, it was formed by a dungeon with a difficulty level not lower than rank of the moon continued to glow with a strange color. The expert noted that the moon, which they can observe over the capital, was the core of the fall. He added that they have yet to see the warriors protecting this core. Kiritani glanced at the window. Zai crossed his arms. So it's an allergy to mana? The main character asked. Sho asked how Agawa was feeling. She was holding onto the wall. Yuri said she was fine. Light shone through the hospital window. Higawa asked Kiritani if he was a recruit who worked with her brother. Zai replied that it was true. Higawa looked down. Yuri asked what her brother had told Kiritani about her. She folded her hands and pressed them to her body. Something about me being a burden, Higawa continued, frustrated. Yuri felt that it was her fault that her brother had died. Kiritani informed Higawa that Ren didn't die because of her. Doctors examined the victims. The main character said that if Yuri doesn't believe it, then she should accept the guilt and make it her motivation. Igawa put her hands on her chest. Sai had said that then, one day, she would be able to overcome him, but she had to remember that Ren had always thought of her. The main character asked her to never forget about it. Igawa's eyes filled with tears. Iri put her hands to her face. Kiritani was pointing at the core. He said they would continue after he destroyed this thing. There was a big fire in the city. The entire city was filled with monsters. Sai rushed forward. Kiritani attacked the monster. Zai was thinking that over the past few days, after he had destroyed a bunch of monsters, he had come to a conclusion. The protagonist's eyes were full of confidence. He felt that there was no point in leveling up stats other than mana. Kiritani destroyed the monsters one by one. Zai knew that if he improved his physical attack and flexibility, there would be more chances to win, but their maximum was too low. Kiritani continued on his way to the core. A memory of the conversation popped up in his mind. Zai was sitting in a cafe with a stranger. So you want to test how effective the physical attack stat is? What is it? He asked. Kiritani thanked him for his understanding. Zai's gaze was focused on the core. He was thinking that after arm wrestling with a hunter who had 11 physical attack stats, Zai realized how big the difference was. There were many monsters in Kiritani's path. The main character knew that he didn't have time, so he had to hurry. Zai jumped up. He pushed away from the monster. Kiritani flew up. He was thinking of 29 mana points. The system notified him that his mana had increased by 29 points. Zai pushed off from the edge of the skyscraper. Kiritani headed up. Zai thought it was a great feeling. Kiritani was suspended in midair. In his hand was a sword. Zai activated his technique. The main character threw his sword. The sword flew towards the core. Kiritani hoped it would make it. Zai started to fall down. Kiritani was rapidly falling to the ground. Zai landed on the ground. Kiritani assumed it was useless, but his level wasn't high enough. The main character understood that he needed to come up with something else. There was a huge explosion in the city. Zai was taken aback. Aoki arrived on Earth. Her abilities included Thunderbolt, Thunder Gust, and Light Rain. Sora used one of the techniques. Lightning formed around her. Her attack was aimed at the core. Aoki's attack hit the core. She was glad that it had worked. 
a new core appeared in front of her. Sora was taken aback. Aoki assumed that Luna was the protector. From the core, something began to fall to the ground. Sora raised her weapon. With her technique, she tried to block it. Lightning formed around Aoki. Zaya watched it happen. The main character caught the falling Aoki. Kiritani was thinking that he expected a lot from her because it was said on TV that she was an SS rank hunter, but C held Sora back. Kiritani asked her to concentrate. Zai noted that many lives now depend on her. Aoki didn't understand who he was. She ordered them to get away from her. Zai pricked up his eyes. Kiritani thinks about Aoki spending a lot of mana. He took her by the back. Sho asked him to direct Aoki's mana as he would show her. Sora was surprised that Kiritani had changed her mana flow. Aoki looked incredulous. She noted that now is not the time. Sora thought she just needed to. Suddenly, mana filled Aoki's body. Sora was surprised that her mana had stabilized. No, my mana is overflowing. Aoki kept thinking. There was a fiery aura around the hunters. Sora assumed that she had used up all the supplies she had, but she didn't know how. Aoki realized that this wasn't the time to think about it. Sora's technique was aimed at the core. Aoki said that Kiritani's ability wasn't bad. Sora realized that they were on the same side. Anyway, let's destroy this thing, Zai added. Aoki activated her technique. She talked about what she knew. Her technique moved towards the core. There was an explosion all over the city. The core was destroyed. Sora was holding her weapon. She thought she did it. Kiritani's gaze was directed upwards. He noted that this is not all. Aoki was shocked. The core continued to operate. Zai said the core is still alive. He thought it was funny. The main character was pointing at the core. Zai asked if she could hit him again. Aoki was sitting in the pit. She said it was impossible. Sora added that she was on the limit, so she wouldn't be able to. Kiritani was looking at the core. He knew that as sad as it might sound, all they had to do was wait for it to be replenished. Zai's face was full of determination. The main character said that then he would deal with it. Kiritani stood on top of Aoki's weapon. Sora didn't understand what he was doing. Kiritani was standing on top of her weapon. Sho asked if Aoki was the best hunter in Japan. He assumed that it would have enough strength to launch one person into flight. Sora watched Kiritani floating in the air. She asked him if he was talking to himself. Zai said that there was no time to explain, but he asked her to repeat something from the category of the attack that she had just made. Aoki noticed that Sho was a strange guy. She sent Kiritani flying. Sora added that she didn't care if it ended badly. Zai flew forward. He was heading for the core. The main character believed that the forces were applied enough. Kiritani thought that if he could get closer. Zai was thinking about 5 mana points. The screen displayed his current mana pool. Kiritani thought that now, from such a short distance, he threw down his sword. Zai nudged the sword with his foot. His weapon moved swiftly forward. Kiritani's sword flew at an incredible speed. It was aimed at the core. His weapon hit the core. There was a strong explosion. The core particles flew in different directions. Aoki was shocked. She watched Zai fall. Sora thought he was crazy. Grains of the core were scattered all over the city. The screen alerted Kiritani to her new ability. Zai was falling down. He was glad of the new ability. The main character was taken aback. Kiritani noticed that he was falling from a great height. Sora had seen him fall. Aoki stood in the middle of the rubble. She was thinking that Zai had not only redirected her mana, but also broken the rift core. Sora speculated about the existence of SS rank hunters besides her. The sun was shining brightly outside. The news anchor reported that the fault that occurred yesterday was assessed as an unusually rare phenomenon of S-plus complexity. Biri was holding the news phone in her hands. The host remarked that it was all thanks to Aoki, who remained calm until the very end. Sora said that in fact, she was helped by another hunter. Aoki noted that he disappeared as soon as it was over, so she doesn't know who it was. Sora added that she would really like to meet him again if it was possible. Igawa was lying on the bed, and Sho was sitting across from her. Don't tell me you are that hunter, Iri said. The main character asked how she was feeling. He supposed it was much easier for her. Egawa said that she was a little worried when she was hospitalized, but now she feels better. The Kiritani were looking down. He wondered if she really needed to know the truth. The main character was sitting on a chair. Miri asked Zai if he was a new recruit now. Kiritani reported that this was so because he eventually awoke. Egawa half rose from the bed. She asked if Zai was going to become a hunter. The main character said that he doesn't know, because to become a hunter, you need to pass an exam and all that. Kiritani put his hands in his lap. Iri thought he'd pass it anyway. Zai noted that he meant that his level was still too low. Migawa said that she would support him. There was a smile on her face. Iri was sure that Zai would make a great hunter. The main character was taken aback. He agreed with Iri. Kiritani went to the window. Zai noted that the status won't change anything. In any case, Kiritani was thinking about the hunter exam. He thought about trying to pass it. Lands for the hunter examination. An F-rank dungeon. Not your rainforest. 
The plot takes us to the location of the hunter exam. The stranger greeted the people and asked them how they were feeling. He informed them of Channel Ahead, Hunter, which reveals the secrets of hunters. The stranger held the phone on a tripod and continued to broadcast. He stated that they would be broadcasting the 558th hunter test in the examination grounds. He was interrupted by a guy who made a request to him. He apologized for bothering me. The guy asked if he could distract him for a second. SSS rank hunter. Yes, said the young man. He asked if Aoki Sora had four abilities when she awoke. The young man stated that he had woken up with three. The plot was shown to us by Yabuki Go. He was a hunter examinee. The stranger continued to listen to Yabuki with interest, holding a tripod with a phone in his hands. He noted that Gu is confident in himself. The stranger asked what rank Yabuki was aiming for in this exam. Gu said that he came here for the first place. Yabuki didn't know if there was any point in settling for less. Kiritani was standing behind Gu, holding a sword in his hand. Sai was thinking about the fact that Gu at most has the rank of a the main character turned his head towards Aoki. The guy said that Aoki Sora had arrived. Sora was standing next to the examiner. He stated that this time the test will be watched by a special guest, Aoki Sora. Aoki tilted her head forward. She greeted the participants by saying her name. She hoped that the participants would show off their abilities. The guys were shocked by her appearance. They couldn't believe that Sora had arrived for the exam. The boys rushed in her direction. One of them suggested that it was the first time Aoki had come to watch the exam. The stranger asked the others to move because he couldn't see anything. The main character stood behind the guys and thought. Kiritani guessed that guests weren't usually invited here. Sai thought that it would be problematic to interfere, so he would like to avoid their meeting. A memory pops up in his head that is related to Aoki. Kiritani thought it would be better to just stay out of her way. Sora's face was confused. The examinee said that Aoki Sora is the best. The young man said that after passing the test, he would definitely enter the poison, he asked Aoki to wait. The examiner asked them to be quiet. A memory of the request popped up in Sora's mind. She was surprised that she was asked to be a guest in the exam. Aoki was sitting on the sofa opposite the man. Sora didn't understand why she needed to do this. The man was talking about the rift that she destroyed. He asked if it was due to the Dortholemian dessert dungeon. He was holding a glass of alcohol in his hand. The story introduces us to Uharu Junasuk, who is the owner of the Poison Guild. Sora, who was sitting on the sofa, leaned her hands on it. Uharu said that because their guild was in the dungeon at the time of the incident, people thought they were just putting on a show for Aoki. She thought it was disgusting. Junasuk agreed with her, but they couldn't ignore her. He thought it was obvious that the next exam would be the president of the Japan Association. Uharu had a smile on his face. Junasuk stated that if Sora participated, they would be able to regain the trust of both the people and the authorities. Uharu suggested that after that, the rumors should also die down. Junasuk pointed out that if Aoki found any worthy newcomers, she should take them to the guild. The participants moved forward. The examiner apologized for the delay. He announced that the 558th hunter exam was beginning. Quadrocopters flew on the territory of the exam. The news anchor was being filmed by a cameraman. The examiners began their journey. Kiritani was sitting on a tree branch. He thought that his task was to hold out here for a day. Zai watched the running contestants. The main character assumed that everyone else was following the program. Kiritani tilted his head forward. Zai thought it was very simple, but that made it boring. Kiritani's body was covered in an aura. Zai turned his attention to something. The main character was thinking about the mana flow. Kiritani looked confused. Zai thought that the guy was very weak, but he was sure that it was someone from his past. Kiritani wondered if this meant that someone else had been reborn besides him. The man closed his eyes. He was wondering who would be number one this time. The plot introduces us to Wakamatsu Kenzu, who was the president of the Hunters Association. Aoki was standing in front of the examiner, holding a clipboard. She suggested that it might be Yabuki Go. Sora reported that Gu received three abilities during his awakening. The examiner thought about the number of abilities. Sora looked at him thoughtfully and asked him a question, whether the examiner has a different opinion. His eyes were fixed on the tablet. He assumed that the young ones had forgotten. The examiner stated that the person who first stopped the rift in Japan Hellfire was a hunter of rank below us. Aoki looked at him thoughtfully. Sora knew that she couldn't say anything to someone who had seen everything in person. Aoki asked who the president thought would be first. He guessed that the guy at number 241 had potential. The president noted that that guy doesn't waste a single minute of his free time. In her tablet, Sora started searching for him. The main character was shown on the screen. Aoki's aura covered her body. The president said that the guy's name is Kiritani C and he is 20 years old. He noted that even though Zai is young, he remains surprisingly calm. 
the president didn't know how to say it correctly. He thought Kiritani was acting like him on the battlefield. Sora had a gloating smile on his face. She was thinking of Kiritani Sho. Aoki thought that Sho had just woken up. The main character was sitting on a tree branch. He was surprised by the hunter exam. Zai was holding a sword in his hand. Kiritani watched the group of examinees who were talking to the youth. Yabuki said that the young man was always sharp-tongued, ever since high school. Gu said that looking at the young man, he could tell how much money his grandfather had invested in him. The youth activated the mana flow in his hand. He was sure that he had already told Yabuki not to dare slander his grandfather. The story introduces us to Kishida Shin. Gu activated the flow of mana all over his body. He asked if Kishida wanted a fight. Yabuki said that Shin is a loser with one ability. The main character appeared before them. A look of incomprehension crossed Gu's face. He didn't understand what Sai was doing here. Yabuki said that he had no idea who he was, but if he didn't want to interfere, then he should leave. Kiritani turned his head in Kishida's direction. Sai told Gu that he would do as Gu advised. Kiritani noted that he has met too many problematic people recently, while Sai added that he hates problems. The main character grabbed Kishida. Kiritani said that he would take this guy with him. Shin didn't understand what was going on. Abuki and the others gave chase. He ordered them to stop Zai and Shin from leaving. Kiritani kicked them with his foot. Gu's allies flew out of the way. Zai continued his escape. Kishida asked who he was. The main character fixed his gaze on Shin. Kiritani said about a slan at a rebirth. Zai asked if Shin was familiar with the words. Kishida tried to turn towards Kiritani. He said he didn't understand anything. Zai pointed out that Kishida had better tell the truth. Sho was talking about the mana spell that Shin uses radial. Kiritani asked if Shin knew about it. Sho asked who taught Kishida this spell. Kishida's face was agitated. He asked how Zai knew his ability. Shin assumed he knew something. The main character stopped running. They stopped behind a large rock. Kiritani said that in short, Shin awoke with the ability that his grandfather taught him. Kishida was holding a spear in his hands. Shin asked if there was a problem. Kiritani noted that this is one big problem. The main character thought of Radial, who became an ability, Zai believed that he could be the key to his past. Kiritani leaned his head on his hand. It doesn't matter, you'll be a good pawn, in the sense of an assistant, Zai said. Shin noted that he is not eager to be someone's pawn or assistant. Kiritani asked him his name. Shin put his hand on his chest. He said his name was Kishida. Shin added that he was 19 years old and in his first year of university. The main character stated that his name is Kiritani Sho and he is 20 years old. Kishida noted that Sho was older than him. He asked Kiritani to take care of him. Zai was standing in front of a large rock. Kiritani asked if the person who taught Shin the radial technique was his grandfather. Kishida said it was true. The main character put his hand to his chin. He asked if Grandpa Shin had a different name. Sai gave an example of the name Reuben and Robert. Kishida was taken aback. He didn't know what Kiritani was talking about. Shin noted that his grandfather is a full-blooded Japanese. There were a lot of trees around the kids. The main character suggested that Kishida has nothing to do with his past life. He believed that everything cannot be so simple. Kiritani noted that Shin was somehow connected to those guys. Kishida said that the guy who was in the middle was Yabuki Gu, a former classmate of his. Kishida noted that after waking up, Gu constantly bullied those who were weaker. Shin added that he was always fighting with him. Kishida held his own weapon in his hands. Shin said that he was not Gu's equal in ability, so Gu didn't take him seriously. The wind blew her hair. He asked Shin if the number of abilities was important. Kishida stated that this is the case. Shin pointed out that the more abilities you have, the higher your rank. With just one hit, the main character resolved the huge rock. Shin was standing in front of him. Sai stated that he used one mana to do this. He noted that he didn't use the ability at all. Kishida was surprised that Kiritani could do such a thing without the ability. Shin froze in shock. Kishida clenched his weapon in his hands. He asked Zai to teach him this. Shin said he couldn't forgive rotten people like Yabuki. Kiritani lifted his head up. The main character said that he would teach him without any problems. Zai noted that there is one condition. He asked Shin to sit down. Gu was grinning at Shin. He didn't think Kishida would come back here on his own. Yabuki believed that Shin wanted to die before the end of the exam. The main character turned his head towards Kishida. He ordered him to act. Zai was standing behind Kishida. Kiritani noted that this is Shin's fight and he will not interfere. Kishida asked him not to worry. Fear appeared on Gu's face. Yabuki thought that Shin had somehow changed. Gu's gaze was directed downwards. He didn't think it was important because Shin was a loser with only one ability. Yabuki believed that he would win and even with his eyes closed. The main character's face was quite serious. Gu believed that the outcome was already predetermined. A smirk appeared on Yabuki's face, he thought it was a waste of time. In his hand, Kishida held a weapon as Gu and his allies stood in front of him. Shin pointed out that Yabuki hadn't changed since high school. Kishida thought he was stupid. 
Goku activated the mana flows on his body. He ordered Shin to stop talking. Kabuki stated that he could use his powers however he wanted. Kishida charged into the battle. Shin asked Gu not to cause any problems to those who were not involved. Yabuki activated a magic shield that blocked Shin's attack. Gu continued to maintain his technique. He thought Kishida was a pathetic worm, and Yabuki asked if Kishida really thought he would let him attack. Shin tried to break through the magic shield. Gu reported that if this mana shield is physically attacked, it activates the mana burst ability. Kishida kept trying to break through his defense. Shin thought that he was too hot, he thought that his hand was going to melt. The main character watched the fallen tire. Zai noted that Kishida has a habit of keeping her distance. Kiritani suggested that he try to avoid the habit tomorrow. Especially if we use Radial correctly in the matches starting tomorrow, Zai continued. Shin charged into the fight again. Kishida was thinking that everything was happening as Kiritani said. Shin was thinking that he only had one hit. Kishida's face was full of confidence. He was thinking of covering his mana with a spear. Shin threw a punch at Gu's magic shield. Kishida was thinking about concentrating all of his mana into a single point. Shin was notified about the ability increase. Rank Radial became B Kishida Delta Blow to Yabuki. Shin was thinking of striking directly into the center of the fire. Gu's magic shield began to crack. Kishida broke through his defense. Yabuki's shield shattered. Gu's face was shocked. Kishida threw a punch at Gu's stomach. Yabuki flew to the side. Gu was finally able to stop. He couldn't believe what had happened. Shin attacked Yabuki from behind. Gu slammed his face into the ground. Kishida watched the fallen Gu. Shin said that he was able to beat him. With both hands, Shin grabbed onto his weapon. He couldn't believe he was going to win. Kishida claimed to have defeated Yabuki before he could even use the ability. A smile appeared on his face. Shin noted that he was able to win thanks to Zai. Kiritani watched Gu's defeated allies. The main character praised Kishida. Shin knelt before Sho. He asked what they were going to do with the cubes this guy had. Kiritani reported that they split them 50-50. The main character headed towards Shin. Kishida was holding a bag of cubes in his hands. Wait, is this even? Shin asked, puzzled. Kishida pointed out that he only had 20%. Kiritani informed him that he had talked about it before their class. The guys were in the woods. Zai stated that he would take a portion of Kishida's income as payment for lessons. Shin was surprised that Kiritani was serious back then. Zai asked if he had forgotten. Kiritani noted that if Shin thinks about what he will teach him, then the deal is not bad at all. Kishida held the cube bag to his chest. The main character said that the exam will end soon. He asked Kishida what he thinks about killing time for hunting. Shin said that if he could, he would have done it long ago. Kishida pointed out that the only person who could do it in the remaining 12 minutes was Sho. A memory of Kiritani's fight popped up in Shin's mind. The main character said it didn't matter. Zai showed his phone to Kishida. He asked Shin if it was the right number. Kiritani added that if he contacts Kishida, he'd better come. Zai asked Shin to keep their deal a secret. Kishida understood his request. Kiritani began to move forward. He told Shin that he would go. Kishida asked him to wait because there were still a few procedures left. The main character opened a portal to another world. Zai noted that the organizers can take care of this. Shin thanked him for saving her. Kiritani waved at him as he continued walking into the portal. History tells us that Kiritani Sho became the best among the participants of the 588th Hunter exam. Kiritani stepped out of the portal. He was thinking that there were a lot of people like Shin. Zai thought about the need to recruit people to create a new guild. The main character understood that to do this, he needed to be at least rank C. Kiritani believed that you need to increase your rank as quickly as possible. Aoki was coming to meet him. Their eyes locked. Zai claimed that she was mistaken. Sora asked me to wait a little longer. She noted that she hadn't said anything yet. The main character turned in her direction. Kiritani asked if she had any questions. Aoki said these questions are personal. Sora said that she didn't think that he would be the first to leave without any formalities and leave like this. Aoki added that he also left by using the black exit portal and ended up right in the middle of the city. Sora pulled the mask off her face. Aoki invited Sho to chat for a while. We are shown a hunter's shop. Zai noted that this combat jacket looks cool. Sora was watching Kiritani in a new thing. She noticed that it suited him. Aoki thought that this jacket would suit someone like Sho, who specialized in speed combat. There were various elixirs and armors on the table. Sora added that these things are for restoring stamina too. Aoki was talking about a knee pad and a belt, and she mentioned that Sho still needed a bag for her things. Sora was pointing at an object that was higher up. The main character thought that he expected this from the SS rank, since these things are of the highest quality. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I don't think you can bribe me that way, Kiritani said. There was a bag in front of him. Aoki pointed out that he needed to worry about that. Sora was wearing a mask and glasses. 
Aoki revealed that in her career as a hunter, she was slightly above him in status. Sora said that if something unexpected happens in the dungeon, it's not unusual. Aoki noted that this is, as many say, the choice of those who are ready for anything. She asked him not to think of it as a favor. The main character was standing in front of the ticket office. Aoki added that this money is his reward for helping to fight the rift. Kiritani said that he sees no reason to refuse. Sai turned his attention to the corner of materials. He was surprised that they were selling them as well. Sora noted that the materials should be selected by an expert. Kiritani was standing with two large bags. Aoki thought that should be enough to win show over. Sora looked at the purchase receipt. Kiritani and Aoki were standing in the elevator. Zai noticed that she was silent too much. Sora told him what he thought. She was shocked by the price of the materials. Aoki looked in Sho's direction. Aoki said that she would now get to the main point. Sara noted that this was her official proposal. Aoki pulled down her mask again. She asked Kiritani to join their guild. Sora stated that she promised that he would be treated the same as her. The main character's eyes narrowed. Zai said he refused. Sora continued to stare at him. Aoki asked me not to make a decision so quickly, she wanted to know at least one reason. Kiritani said he didn't have a reason. He added that he doesn't like working for anyone. The boys put the bags on the floor. Aoki said that she will change the offer. Sora put her hand on her chest. She asked me to work with her. Aoki stated that she wanted to feel the power that she gained with him in battle. The elevator headed for the first floor. Kiritani asked her why. Zai asked if she was a top hunter in Japan. There was confidence in Aoki's gaze. She said that she wants to reach even greater heights. Sora noted that the more people believe in her, the more results she should show. Aoki extended her hand forward. Sora added that this is the reason why she needs to get stronger. The main character closed his eyes. He agreed to Aoki's request. Outside, the sun was setting. Kiritani noted that he is also interested in what Japan's first hunter will become. Sora was holding her own weapon. She informed Zai that this was her private gym. Aoki added that this is the biggest and quietest place. Sora asked if that was enough. The main character drew attention to Aoki's weapon. Kiritani asked if she had taken over for him. Sora reported that the pass broke the day they destroyed the moon. Wind currents appeared around Aoki. Sora stated that she would try not to use much of her mana. Kiritani pointed out that she can use mana however she wants. Aoki informed him, anticipated his words. Mana began to appear on her body. Sora asked me to get ready. Aoki charged. She pointed her weapon at Kiritani. Zai blocked her attack. Aoki was thrown backward. In his hands, Kiritani held a sword. The main character thought that because she doesn't control mana so well, Aoki splits it and the fight turns into a brute force parade. Zai pointed his sword at her. Sora was ready for another attack. The main character became interested. Aoki charged. Kiritani dodged her attack. Sora's weapon was shrouded in mana. Zai jumped out of the way. Lightning sparkled on all sides. Kiritani's gaze was serious enough. Sho pointed his sword at Aoki. His weapon almost touched Sora. The main character was taken aback. Kiritani's attack will be stopped by a magic shield. Zai was thinking that its accumulation was located where his sword couldn't penetrate. Sora prepared to attack again. She couldn't believe that Kiritani was an F-rank hunter. The main character stepped back. Zai said that this is true on paper. Kiritani dropped his sword to the floor. The main character began to realize that it would not end so quickly. Aoki became alert. She asked if Zai was giving up. Kiritani's body was wrapped in mana. Zai reported that if he used mana, he wouldn't be able to hold back. He asked Aoki not to think so badly of him. The system alerted Kiritani to an increase in mana. Zai said that this only means his confession. The main character headed towards Sora. Aoki's lightning spread throughout the entire training hall. Sho guessed that Sora wouldn't let him get so close to her. Kiritani dodged Aoki's lightning bolts. Zai was wondering if there was an ability. The main character grabbed the lightning bolt with his hand. Sora was taken aback. She was amazed that Kiritani had just grabbed the lightning bolt with his bare hands. Sho attacked Aoki from above. Sora didn't understand what he was doing. The main character attacked Aoki from behind. Zai threw a punch. Kiritani thought about the technique Aoki had taught him in his previous life. Kiritani activated the technique in his hand. He couldn't believe he was using her now. Zai used the through palm technique. Due to the impact, Sora flew up. A memory popped up in her head. The man asked Aoki about how she had woken up and received four abilities. Aren't you going to be the face of Japan in the future? He continued. Someone was looking at Aoki from behind. The stranger said that she is not just talented. He asked me to look at Sora. The stranger noted her grace and boldness. Aoki appeared in front of a group of people. 
The stranger assumed that Sora had sacrificed a lot during the rift. He offered to raise her to S rank. The stranger said that they would wait for her new achievements. Sora tilted her head down. She thanked them. Aoki noted that everyone was waiting for them because it was her responsibility. Sora turned her attention to the man who was standing in front of her. The man looked back at Aoki. He noted that Sora has been out on assignments for three consecutive days. The man offered to take her a day off and relax at home. Aoki's eyes were fixed on the clipboard. Sora pointed out that he was right and that she should stay home today. The girl asked what the guy was doing. Aoki saw a crowd of high school students. The girl asked him to stop. She repeated the request. The guy made funny faces, thereby making his friends laugh. There was sadness in Aoki's eyes. The man called out to her. A memory of high school students having fun popped up in her head. The man asked if everything was alright. Sora headed towards the car. She said she was fine. Aoki asked me to take her to the rift. Sora asked if she had lost. Zai told her that it was true. Sora said that she was prepared for this, but it exceeded all her expectations, so now she is ashamed. The main character noted that this was expected, given that Sora was carrying on her shoulders alone. Aoki watched Kiritani standing across from her. Sora claimed that no one had asked her to be lectured. Aoki said it was too heavy to carry the entire country on her shoulders. The main character was taken aback. Kiritani noted that this is obvious. He added that it wasn't Sora who decided to carry everything on her shoulders. Tears appeared on Aoki's face. Sora sat down on the floor, lowering her head. Zai asked her to take her time. Kiritani stated that no matter how much pressure Aoki puts on herself, it won't change anything. The main character asked to understand it correctly. Zai added that he still supports her actions. On Aoki's face, she looked up at Kiritani. Sora asked Sho to teach her the secret of his power. Kiritani held out his hand. The main character agreed with her, but only on the condition that Sora goes to her. Screams are heard in the dungeon. Kishida deflected the goblin's attack. The monster jumped back. The goblin attacked Shin again. Kishida impaled him with his spear. Shin defeated the goblin. Kishida turned his head towards Kiritani. He informed Zai that he had cleared the area. Kiritani was glad of that. Shin stood in front of the fallen monsters. Kishida assumed that he had seen this place before, and the main character thought he was imagining it. The story takes us to Saitama Prefecture, a dungeon of rank E. The plot showed us the One Piece Shield. Shin added that this shield was given to him by C, and it suits him very well. Kiritani said that from now on Kishida will be a tank. Shin was looking in Sho's direction. He asked if it was too sudden. The main character stated that he was giving a role that suited Shin's abilities. He asked him not to object. A smile appeared on Kishida's face. He noted that if it is a tank, it will go first. Kiritani was heading forwards through the dungeon. Sho was glad that Kishida had a talent. And I've broken everything with Aoki Sora, so it's time for me to focus on quickly getting C rank so I can start a guild. Kiritani continued to think. The main character heard Shin's screams. He thought about how he could focus on gathering information about his past life. Shin pointed a startled finger forward. Zai asked what had happened. In front of them was a dead warrior. Kishida said he saw a human skeleton. A torch was burning in the dungeon. The main character leaned over the corpse. Zai assumed it was a tank. Kiritani noted that he died not so long ago. Kishida asked if he was sure. Zai's gaze was fixed on the shield. He thought that the mana was barely noticeable, but he could still feel the remnants of it. Suddenly, Kiritani jumped up and ran in the other direction. Zai called Shin over to him. Dead hunters lay in their path. Kiritani noted that he thought so. Kishida asked if this monster was stronger than they thought. Zai was holding a sword in his hands. Kiritani didn't think this was the work of a monster. Zai asked Shin to pay attention to the position of their bodies. Tank attacker Hiller, Kiritani listed. The main character noted the order in which their bodies lay. Zai leaned over the body of the dead hunter. Kiritani thought that they had killed the most troublesome hiller first, and then taken on the attacker and the tank. Zai thought that Dungeon E's monster wouldn't think of such a thing. The main character's eyes narrowed. Zai claimed that it was all the work of another hunter. Kishida was surprised by his words. Shin assumed there would be a boss room. The guys came to a room where various things were scattered. Kiritani guessed that this place looked very much like someone's camp. Kishida turned his attention to the bed. Shin thought it looked like a hideout. Zai assumed that they even committed murder. He thought they were really terrible people. 
Kiritani saw traces of mana. Zai thought that they had run away after their hideout was discovered. Kiritani was thinking about the traces of mana that were still clearly visible, and Kishida held his head. Kishida couldn't believe that they were in the dungeon they were hunting in, Shin took it as bad luck. Sho didn't understand what kind of bad luck Kishida was talking about. A smirk appeared on the protagonist's face. He didn't think there were any luckier people than they were. Kiritani activated the hangman screen. Zai was glad that it was time to try out this ability. Doctors put the man's body in the car. The man asked them to put it down quickly. That first please, he added. Tamura Khan was standing in front of Sho. He noted that he and Kiritani had not seen each other for a long time. Kang said he didn't think they would meet again under such circumstances. The main character crossed his arms. Tamura assumed that Sho was awake. Tamura spread out his hands. Kiritani was startled that Kang said that just by looking at him. Tamura noted that this is already a professional reformation, if you can say so. His gaze was directed at Zai. Kang added that since Kiritani is a witness, he asked him to discuss the situation with the commissioners. Tamura noted that he unfortunately has other things to do. Khan was pointing at the Major. Tamura said he was leaving show to her. The Major thanked Khan for his help. The body of a person was placed in a car. So the first witnesses were Kiritani C and Kashida Shin. What is it? She asked. She said her name was Kaoru Takibana, and she represented the Hunter Control Department. Kaoru was looking at the Hunters. Takibana asked if there were only two of them. The main character said that this is so. Kaoru asked if they noticed anything suspicious or strange. Zai noted that he had never seen anything like this before. The Major said that such incidents don't happen in E-rank dungeons. Kaoru added that it brings back memories of her hunting past. Kiritani asked if he could borrow her card. Zai added that they will continue to hunt here for a while. Takibana handed him a business card. She thanked him for his cooperation. Kiritani turned his attention to the sign. He thought about how he had seen it earlier when he was a rookie, and he said the name, Control Departmento himself. The Major was talking to her subordinate. Based on the severity of the incident, are employees being interviewed this time? Zai continued to think. Takibana asked if it was a matter of time. The guy told her that it was so, he asked her to move out. Kaoru waved her hand. The Major added that if Zai remembered anything, he should let her know. Kiritani accepted her request. The main character was thinking about hunters who hunt other hunters. He was thinking that he could barely sense any mana. Zai was surprised that the hunters were hiding in the shadows. The Major was moving forward. Kiritani thought they'd better hurry. Kashida called out to show. Shin asked if they were going to finish what they started. Zai said that they would rest for a while today. The plot takes us to Amiya. The main character looked around. He turned his attention to the aura that was behind the wall. Kiritani looked up at the skyscrapers at night. Zai thought about how he was hiding in a public place. Kiritani thought it was cute. The main character went to the elevator. Zai was approaching the door where the aura was coming from. Kiritani assumed he was here. Zai was standing in front of the room. Kiritani considered. He put his sword to the door. He used his weapon to open the door. Zai heard a sound. Kiritani watched the broken window. The main character looked outside. The stranger escaped. Kiritani jumped out of the window. Zai gave chase. He was trying to catch up with the stranger. The stranger was cornered. Kiritani started toward him. The stranger asked who he was. He assumed that the sea was an association or army. The wind was blowing outside. Kiritani noted that if he surrenders, it will make his fate easier. The stranger took a knife from his back pocket. He asked if Kiritani was a hero. The stranger added that unfortunately for her, he is not going to give up. The stranger lunged at her. He added that he needed to get rid of Kiritani. The stranger attacked him from above. There was a smirk on his face. He asked if Zai really thought he could surprise him. The stranger attacked Kiritani. He pointed out that he would stab him in one blow. The main character headed in his direction. Zai kicked the stranger's leg. Kiritani knocked him to the floor. The main character said that he had a lot of questions for a stranger. Zai asked why he lived in the dungeon. Kiritani held the stranger in his grip. The main character asked how old the stranger was and what his name was. Zai also asked who his allies were. The stranger didn't know what was wrong with Kiritani. He assumed that Zai was related to one of the deceased. The stranger said they were a bunch of pathetic worms. The stranger had a smirk on his face. He was talking about how they just got rid of a couple of people. The stranger asked what the big deal was. 
The stranger believed that the main character could not do anything without a trial. Zai closed his eyes. He ordered the Kiritani to stop acting like hired guns and just arrest him. Did you think that I was just threatening you like this and you would be able to do the same thing as before? Kiritani asked. The stranger was startled. He didn't understand what was going on. Zai noted that he doesn't think he will return alive. The main character added that he would not judge him according to the laws. Kiritani attacked him. The stranger was defeated. The system notified him about the level increase. Zai was surprised that his level increased from eliminating such a guy. Kiritani noticed another notification. The screen indicated that he was receiving an S rank super spell. He noted that he even got the ability. He was informed that the karma of the heretics was becoming his power. The main character figured out how the screen works. Kiritani added that it will be necessary to take a closer look at this later. On the ground lay a fallen stranger. So the term heretics and the executioner's ability refers to simple criminals? Zai continued to think. Kiritani thought it was a good way to get stronger. He understood what the system was trying to say. Zai was thinking about getting rid of the heretics. The main character continued to study the system. Kiritani answered the phone. The man told him that the control department had noticed him. He asked if Zai could at least answer the phone. The man said that day X will soon come. He asked Kiritani not to get caught by them. Zai had a smile on her face. The main character asked who he was talking to. He asked if it was a newly formed gang. Kiritani noted that they were still just kids. Zai watched the fallen stranger. Kiritani asked them what they were up to to involve such criminals. The main character continued to talk to him. The man noted that if he values his life, then it is better for him to close his mouth. Zai assumed that he had found a big deal. He asked her to explain in more detail when this day X would happen. The man called him a pathetic worm and he continued to threaten Zai. Kiritani smashed the phone. He found it boring. In his hands, Sho was holding Takabana's business card. Kiritani continued to stare at her. Zai thought he should thank the government employees for giving him the information. The man slapped the table. The guy asked if the captain was all right. The captain said they caught poppies. There was anger on his face. Don't tell me they found out about us. The guy continued. The man told him that he did not know. He assumed that it was the control department. The captain crossed his arms. He thought that if the poppies were caught, then the enemy was also a hunter. The captain didn't understand why an ordinary hunter who wasn't connected to the state would try to stop them. In front of us was Joshima Ryuji. He was in a rank hunter. Joshima's punch left a mark on the table. Ryuji noted that they had lost a lot of time. Joshima said that they need to move on to the next place. He was talking about meeting this guy. The plot takes us to Tentu Special Prison. The subordinate said that it was impossible to breathe here. The major was moving forward. Takibana reported that it was because of the silencer material. Keoru added that it prevents hunters from using their abilities. She and her subordinate walked forward. The major said that once in prison, hunters of a rank and below lose their abilities. Takibana added that as rank hunters can only use half of their abilities. The subordinate asked why the major wanted to meet in such a place. Keoru noticed that he also knew this guy. Takibana walked towards the prisoner. The subordinate was surprised that he was familiar with a criminal who is in a similar prison. The prisoner had a smile on his face. The major asked if the subordinate knew him. He said he'd heard of it. The prisoner noted that they had not seen Takibana for a long time. Ah, you're a major now, right? He continued. In front of us was Hijikata Yusaku, a former hunter instructor in the control department. Keoru's gaze was fixed on Yusaka. The major said he'd talked too much in the last eight years. Hijikata asked if this was good news. He was talking about how hunters get promoted so quickly. Takibana noted that Yusaku taught her the rules of interrogation himself. She said that she would appreciate it if Yusaku would stop talking nonsense. Hijikata raised his hand. He assumed that the major had become a full-fledged expert. Keoru tossed the two photos onto the table. Takibana called the name Jaoshima Ryuji, Keoru said. She was talking about the fact that the guy who was a subordinate in the class made his move. The major added that recently organizational and specialized crimes began to occur more often as if he was engaged in their management. With a smirk on his face, Yusaka stated that he was familiar with the name. Are you saying that I'm secretly controlling it even though I can't even contact it? Hijikata asked. Keoru slammed her hands down on the table. She said that this time she would make sure that Yusaka couldn't lift a finger here. 
Takabana noted that an event similar to the attempted assassination of the Prime Minister eight years ago will not happen again. Yusaka started laughing. He asked Takibana if she ever felt the weight of her responsibilities. Kaoru was furious. She asked if Yusaka was delusional again. Hijikata said that the current staff is a bunch of incompetent people standing above them, so eight years ago, he decided that he wanted to bury them and make an example out of them. Yusaka noted that he regrets the tragedies that occurred during the incident. Takibana gritted her teeth. A memory of this incident appeared in his mind. In it, Hijikata was holding a man by the throat. Yusaka added that Kaoru's father was an outstanding hunter. The prisoner held up his hand. Hijikata noted that he was completely harmless and helpless in a room where the strongest force suppressors were standing. He asked if the Major wanted to push him harder when he was already defenseless. Takibana started walking towards him. She took him by the chain. Kaoru asked if Yusaka had ever been held in this prison. Her eyes were filled with rage. Takibana said she wouldn't let him get out of here. Lamps were lit in the prison. The Major's subordinate was standing across from her. Kaoru revealed that eight years ago, 35 hunters came together to stop Hijikata from trying to kill the Prime Minister. Takibana added that one of the hunters was her father. The subordinate adjusted his glasses. He was surprised by her story. The Major noted that in the end, Tsushikata's terrible actions were stopped by the current traitor Wakamatsu, but she focused on the losses that were irreversible. Kaoru smiled. She said it was all in the past now. Takabana asked her subordinate not to worry about it. She asked him to go back to work. Kaoru picked up her phone. The Major assumed that someone had decided to help them. Night fell on the street. The subordinate was talking about the guy who escaped from the dungeon yesterday. The plot shows us a dungeon of rank D, brick mine. Shin was standing next to C. He asked Kiritani if he would now take materials instead of money. The main character noted that he did not say this. Kiritani said that he would also take materials. Kashida asked why Sho wouldn't sell the cube to get money from it. The main character said that even in the hunter's shop, there are a lot of things that cannot be bought. He told Shin not to worry because they would figure it out. A huge monster was running towards them. Kashida hit the monster with his weapon. Shin was taken aback. Kiritani chopped off the monster's paw. There were blood splatters all over the dungeon. Shin asked why C suddenly needed the materials. The monsters surrounded them from all sides. Kiritani said that he personally did not need them. He said he would explain later. Kashida charged. With a single blow, Zai chopped off the monster's heads. The monsters fell to the ground. Okay, it's him right, Shin asked. Kashida said it was the bull monster of this mine, Lom. Lom was standing directly in front of the hunters. Shin noticed that the boss was huge. Kiritani said it was about time. Kashida was taken aback. The main character rushed to the attack. He assumed that he would get some good materials. Lom tried to hit her. Kiritani began to climb up its leg. He jumped up to strike. Zai pierced the monster with his sword. Kiritani made many attacks. The Lom was cut into small pieces. Zai walked over to his body. On the ground were the remains of the boss. Shin pointed out that he really can't compete with Kiritani. The main character noted that it would be difficult if Kashida was his rival. Shin understood how C was showing his love. I know for a fact that you want to be admired, Kashida added. It was getting dark outside. There was a magical object in front of us. Kiritani was sitting at his desk. He was thinking about the fairy tribe's secret technique for unlocking latent abilities. Sho thought about how he had stayed up all night to create a soul capsule from the materials Aoki Sora had bought him. The main character was holding two packages in his hands. Kiritani understood that the main motive for clearing the dungeon with Shin was the materials to create the soul capsule. Zai tried to activate the soul capsule. The main character has suffered many failed attempts. Night fell on the street. Zai said that the end of attempts and mistakes has come. Lom's chin was in front of him. He hoped he could do it this time. Kiritani started the creation process. His radiance was reflected on Wu Zai's face. In front of him was a soul capsule that absorbed the power of the precious metal. The main character swallowed the capsule. He was glad of his success. Kiritani believed that this way he would be able to raise more than just his mana stats. He was notified of an increase in stamina. Zai raised a hand to his chin. Kiritani thought that this way he wouldn't have to rely on the hangman technique alone. His eyes were fixed on the television where the news was playing. A news anchor announced that an unidentified body was found at an intersection last night. 
He also said that the police continue to investigate the case, believing that it is somehow connected with the crime involving forces that occurred in Fukui province. The main character thought about it. He found this rather unexpected. In his hand, Kiritani was holding a package with some contents. Zai knew that he needed to report their base to the Major. The main character was wondering how far they would go with just these clues. We have a view of the Night City. Takibana was walking through the underground parking lot. She saw that there was a package on her car. There was a broken phone in that bag. In her hands, Kayoru held a piece of paper that said that this phone belonged to Maki Yuyuji. Kiritani was standing behind the wall when Major dialed someone on the phone. Takibana asked Minami to stay put because she was coming right over. The main character headed for the exit. The man said that when a crime involving the forces occurs, Jishima Ruji is always around. The sun cast a shadow on the door. Are you saying that this person is currently in Tokyo? What is it? He asked. Matsuo Duzen, let's put our hands together in front of our faces. Dawson asked the major if she understood the seriousness of the words. Takibana stated that she fully understands the seriousness of her words. Matsuo asked her why she had come to this conclusion. Kioru clasped her hands behind her back. The major reported that only one number was recorded in the burned out phone. Takibana noted that its signal indicates the location of their hideout in Tokyo, where Joshima was last seen. Matsuo put his fingers to his temple. The colonel reported that the incident occurred in Fukui. He added that their motive was a plant of explosive power. A memory of the room they'd searched popped up in his mind. Dawson noted that they also found a lot of evidence that pointed to Fukui at the site of Maki's death. We are shown Joshima, who was also seen in Fukuya. The colonel added that the association sent hunters for this master. He said it was their chance to catch them all at once. Matsuo's gaze was quite serious. The major wondered if Joshima's real target was in Tokyo. Are you saying that his goal is related to Hijikata? What is it? The colonel asked. Kayoru's face was in shadow. She asked him again Takibana was standing in front of the colonel's desk. Matsuo didn't understand what he wanted from this old man. Kaoru assumed that they wanted to attack the Prime Minister again. The Major said that even if that wasn't the case, they might be up to something else. The plot shows us Hijikata. The Major reported that they were already complete. Get ready and wait for the next move. Matsuo closed his eyes. He noted that Takibana always gets turned on when it comes to Hijikata. There was a newspaper on the Colonel's desk. Matsuo said that the Prime Minister is flying abroad today. The colonel asked if Kaoru really thought the prisoner would be able to get back at him for what happened eight years ago. A lamp was shining brightly in the study. Dawson added that the prime minister will be departing from Hanada airport. He noted that this airport is located directly behind the prison where Hijikata is imprisoned. Takibana clenched her fist. The major said that if she was wrong, she would take full responsibility. Kaoru added that if it turns out to be true, they will prevent the tragedy. The colonel's face was full of seriousness. Matsuo noted that Takibana doesn't change. The colonel turned his gaze on her. He asked Kaoru to gather the local police. Dawson stated that he would try to believe Takibana's instincts. The colonel asked me to tell him directly if anything happened. Takibana responded to the colonel's words with a determined and focused look. Kaoru thanked Matsuo. The plot takes us to the outer wall of Tendu prison. The man put his finger to the earpiece. In his hands, the youth held an underground map of the prison. The young man assumed that the Fukuya operation had already begun. He noted that all underground tunnels are displayed on this map. The man ordered him to go with him. The young man agreed. He extended his hand to the wall. The young man put his hand on the wall. He activated the Hand of Death ability. The wall was broken into small pieces. There was a smile on his face. The young man assumed that there was a silencer of materials. He started setting up the device that was on his arm. He said that normally, under such circumstances, he would only be able to use the ability once, but if he put it on, the problem would disappear. He asked everyone to wear bracelets. The man and his subordinates were heading forward. He announced that the operation was beginning. The man led them through the underground passages, looking at the map. He gave the young man a command. The young man applied his technique to the wall. There was a huge hole in the wall. The subordinates started to climb up the stairs. After the man opened the door, he saw two strangers standing in front of him. They asked him who he was and how he got here. The man tossed the map to the floor. He attacked strangers. The man turned his head in the direction of his subordinates. He asked them to hurry up. 
The man noted that the control room was right in front of them. The prison alarm went off. The man pointed to the door. The young man applied his technique to the door. Thanks to his technique, he made a hole in the door. The man leaned toward her. In this hole, the man started to use his technique. Poison was coming out of his mouth. The poison began to spread throughout the room. The prison staff started coughing. The man opened the door a crack. In front of him lay the prison staff, who were unconscious. He noted that so far everything is going smoothly. The man noted that this is only now. He added that if help comes, it will become more difficult. The man started hacking the computer. He pressed the button. The man ordered his subordinates to go to this person. He was watching the security cameras. The prisoner was handcuffed. A smile appeared on Yusaku's face. The man claimed that they were here to pick him up. They knelt before Hijikata. Yusaku was chained up and electric poles were placed around him. What a nice parade, the prisoner said. Yusaku leaned forward. He noted that he was already tired of waiting. It was pitch black outside. A car was speeding down the road. The major said it wasn't enough. Takibana pointed out that they should increase the number of reinforcements coming soon and send all the participants. The major's subordinate was driving the car. Keoru said that after that, if the association can provide help. She asked if anyone was listening to her at all. The connection was cut. Takibana was angry. The car continued to race toward the prison. The story takes us to Tendu Prison. The major burst inside. In front of her were wounded prison workers. One of them said they were only a step too late. Keoru rushed forward. A subordinate informed her that it was too dangerous. His gaze was directed at Joshima. The major was thinking that the suppressors were still working. Takibana thought that if they couldn't use their powers, then they still had a chance to win. In her hands, the major held a pistol. The young man turned his attention to her. He didn't understand what she was doing. Keoru shot him. With his technique, the young man stopped the major's bullet. The bullets hung in the air. A grin appeared on his face. You won't even say hello. What is it? The young man asked. He noted that the hunter control department has very bad manners. Keoru was shocked. The major was shocked by his ability. Takibana noted that the suppressors were still active. The youth continued to use his technique. He declared that the major and his subordinate were pathetic worms. We thought we were going to arrive unprepared, the young man continued. Takibana's eyes were fixed on the bracelets. She assumed that it blocked the effect of suppressors. The prisoner turned his head in Joshima's direction. Joshima asked if he was looking for trouble. Hijikata asked if he was talking about Takibana. A smirk appeared on Yusaku's face. He turned his attention to the major. Did you come to celebrate your release from prison with us? Yusaku asked. Takibana was standing in front of Hijikata. She ordered him to stop talking nonsense. The major asked him to return to his cell. Keoru said she knows that he is targeting the prime minister again, as he did eight years ago. Yusaku noted her shrewdness. Hijikata's gaze was serious. He said that the major's arrival would not change anything. Yusaku said that he didn't plan to fight Keoru because she was already going to die today. The prisoner turned his head towards Takibana. Yusaku apologized to the major. Hijikata noted that the guys at the airport are strict about punctuality. Prison officials opened fire on them. Keoru ordered her subordinates to stop the prisoner from leaving. Takibana pointed out that even if they shot him, it wouldn't matter as long as they stopped him. Joshima activated his technique again. The entire room was filled with poison. The major fired at Hijikata. She ordered him to stand still. The young man said that if Keoru wanted to play with someone, he was right here. The boy grabbed Takabana's tie. Keoru pulled away from him. Her subordinate shot at the youth. He ordered him not to move. The young man asked if the major's subordinate really thought that the major would allow himself to be hit. With his technique, he stopped the bullets flying at him. The youth mocked the hunter control department's abilities. The young man rushed towards the major. He said that he would grind Keoru to powder. His hand flew away. There were traces of blood on the floor. The young man screamed in pain. Kiritani took Takabana by the shoulder. The major was surprised to see him. Sho guessed that it was just the two of them. The major looked at Kiritani in surprise. Zai noted that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. The young man was holding onto his shoulder. He asked if the main character was in the same league as the hunter control department. The youth's face was full of anger. He was surprised that Kiritani could use abilities. The young man noted that he was unusual. The young man liked the main character's strength. He added that his hand was expensive. 
a smirk appeared on Kiritani's face. Zai thought of them as small pawns who couldn't do anything but talk, and he noted that they were the same in all worlds. The young man attacked Kiritani. He didn't know what he was laughing at. Zai took out his weapon. The youth blocked Kiritani's attack. The main character was taken aback. The youth continued to use his technique. Zai was thinking that the young man had instantly created a mana barrier. Kiritani attacked him again. Zai thought it was a small trick. The youth's eyes were filled with horror. The main character pierced him with his sword. The young man fell to the floor. The system notified Sho of his level increase and new ability acquisition Kiritani's gaze was directed at Joshima. The main character declared that he was next. Joshima couldn't believe what he was seeing. He was talking about Kiritani being under the influence of a suppressor. Joshima didn't understand how Sho could release so much mana. There was blood on the tip of Kiritani's sword. The main character believed that it would never end. There were corpses all over the prison. Zai was surprised at the commotion caused by one sinner. A smile appeared on his face. Kiritani noted that you will have to pay for your sins. A memory popped up in Joshima's mind. He thought that he had heard that voice somewhere before. He thought about the words Zai had said to him on the phone. Joshima was angry. He asked if Kiritani had spoken to him on the phone. He activated his technique. Joshima was angry because Sho had killed Maki. He added that the main character may not even dream of a quick death. Kiritani placed the sword on his shoulder. Sho didn't expect Joshima to grieve for his partner. Kiritani asked him to stop whining and attacking. The entire room was filled with Joshima's poison. He ordered Zai to close her mouth. Kiritani dodged his attack. The main character was holding a sword in his hands. Sho thought that compared to Aoki's lightning, Joshima's dead flame was much easier to stop. Its venom was eating away at the surface of the floor. Kiritani thought that a single hit from Joshima's ability was enough to kill anyone. He thought that if he was hurt, it would make him sad. The system alerted Kiritani to an increase in mana. Zai knew that he needed to finish this fight quickly. Joshima continued to attack the main character. Zai was able to dodge his attack. Kiritani rushed towards Joshima. Zai's opponent was able to avoid the blow. Kiritani swung his sword. Joshima was shocked. The main character impaled him. Joshima fell to the floor. The system again notified the Ko about the level increase. Kiritani's weapon was covered in blood. The Major was standing behind him. Takibana was surprised that Kiritani was currently being suppressed. Kioru thought that Sho could move like this without her abilities with only a little sword skill. The main character turned his head towards Takabana. She asked if they had met before in a rank E dungeon. Major asked what the main character's name was. He replied that his name was Kiritani C. The boy and Joshima were lying in a pool of blood. The Major said that this area is close to civilians. She did not understand how he got here. No, more importantly, you seem to have chosen your timing perfectly. Kaoru continued. Kiritani didn't understand what Takibana was trying to say to the man who saved her life. Zai didn't think this was the time to think about it. Throughout the prison, the alarm system continued to work. Kiritani asked if there was another person with them. A memory of Yusaki appeared in the protagonist's mind. He thought that he had only crossed paths with him for a second, but he recognized him immediately. Zai was looking ahead. Kiritani thought that it was rare to find such mana as Hijikata's. Zai considered him the strongest person he had ever met in this world. The Major was confused. A smile appeared on Kiritani's face. Zai thought that everything was going according to his predictions. The main character put his sword on his shoulder. Kiritani asked if they had any more reinforcements. There was a big fire at the airport. The dates take us to Hainda Airport. Everything around Yusaki was ablaze. The soldiers were sitting behind a shelter. They didn't understand what was going on. The guy asked if anyone had any ideas. The man assumed that this was a hunter of at least rank S. The guy tried to look out of hiding. He said that the main plane still has to take off. The man asked to contact the association and request help. He ordered them to shoot at his command. The military opened fire. Using his technique, Hijikata stopped them. All the bullets hit the floor. The military rushed in his direction. They surrounded Yusaki from all sides. Hijikata believed that people didn't learn anything from life. Yusaki covered his hand with fire. He ordered the military to be burned alive. Fire shells flew towards the military. Hijikata hit the nearby planes. An explosion occurred on the territory of the airport. The soldiers started screaming in pain. Yusaka's footprints left a huge dent in the ground. The stranger leaped over the fence. 
Hijikata grabbed his face. Yusaki didn't believe that any of the hunters were still alive. Hijikata slammed the stranger's face into the ground. He started to cry out in pain. Yusaki called him weak. He asked who his instructor was. His hand continued to glow with flames. Yusaki assumed that he couldn't find a politician. Hijikata believed that he was using the military to hide in a safe place and play hide and seek with him. Yusaki was standing in front of the plane. Hijikata had said that the prison was a dark place. He noted that this gave him a great opportunity to learn abilities. The system notified Hijikata of his skills and the addition of a new ability. Yusaki's body was emitting intense flames. A grin appeared on his face. Hijikata considered this ability to be suitable for an instructor. Yusaki blew up the plane. The car was heading towards the airport. In the car were Kaoru, her subordinate, and Kiritani. The Major said that when they reached their destination, she would be on duty. Takibana noted that she recognizes Sho's strength, but Hijikita is on a completely different level. The main character spread his hands. Zai asked that all formalities be omitted and added that his main goal is to help. Kaoru noticed that Kiritani's face suggested otherwise. The Major's gaze was rather serious. She was thinking that all the basics were in Fukuyo right now. Takibana knew that right now, she couldn't be choosy about her choice of backup. Kaoru believed that Sho had proven his strength, and she was thinking of testing him. The Major's car continued to speed forward. The Major thought that she would finally put an end to this. The airport was completely destroyed. The subordinate asked the Major what it was. Takibana was taken aback by Hijikata's fire show. The subordinate put a finger to his head. Kaoru said that she would deal with Yusaki, and she asked Sho and a subordinate to help the victims. The subordinate accepted her order. The main character thought about it. He thought of Hijikata Yusaku, who had been an instructor in the hunter control department in the past, and Kiritani believed that no matter who he was, he was just a mass murderer now. The main character thought that Hijikata fits the criteria of his hangman ability. Kiritani and the major were standing in front of the injured soldiers. Takibana spoke to him. The remains of the fire's ashes were flying in the air. Kaoru stated that they were in an emergency right now, so she didn't care about checking him out. The Major's eyes were fixed on Zai. The Major noted that she could not guarantee his safety. She told me to protect myself. Takibana added that she didn't care how talented Kiritani was, she asked him not to do anything terrible. A grin appeared on Zai's face. Takibana held her hand up to her face. The Major reported that a life and death war was currently underway. Kaoru asked her to be aware of her limits and be careful. The main character thanked her for her advice. He noted that he will remember him. The territory of the airport was falling apart. Hijikata held the dead soldier in his hand. Yusaki said he was waiting for Prime Minister Yoshimaru. Yoshimaru was standing behind Yusaki. He was amazed at his arrival. Hijikata pointed his hand in his direction. Yusaki said that he spent eight years trying to calm himself down, but unfortunately, he could only come to one conclusion. Hijikata said he couldn't stand taking orders from someone like Yoshimara. He noted that the Prime Minister has absolutely no abilities. Yusaki took a step towards him. Kioru was standing behind him. Hijikata noted that he had warned Takibana many times, but she still came. The Major's face was angry. Takibana noted that she could tell Hijikata the same thing. I told you to stay quiet in the cage, and still, you've overstepped your bounds," Kaoru continued. The Major prepared to attack. Hijikata talked about how time flies too fast. Yusaki noticed that Takibana had grown a lot. Kaoru asked him to stop talking nonsense and give up. Hijikata started mocking her words. He lunged at the Prime Minister. Yusaki claimed that she was talking nonsense. The main character swung his sword in front of Yusaki's face. Sho came to Yoshimaru's defense. Kiritani turned his head in the Prime Minister's direction. He asked him to step back. Sho held out his hand for Yoshimaru to stand up. The Prime Minister thanked Kiritani. Yoshimaru also asked who he was. Zai felt that it was best for him not to reveal his name. The airport buildings were destroyed. Kiritani asked if the Prime Minister was injured. Yoshimaru said that he was fine. He said that Sho needed to run away. There was anger on Yusaki's face. Hijikata asked the protagonist who he was. Kiritani held the sword on his shoulder. Zai noted that he had already said who he was before. Kiritani added that there is no need to disclose his name. Hijikata concentrated the mana in his hand. Yusaki heard Sho's reply. He directed the attack towards Kiritani. The main character grabbed the Prime Minister in order to carry him to the shelter. 
Yoshimaru apologized for the inconvenience. Hijikata gave chase. He asked if Zai really thought she could run away from him. Kaoru appeared in his path. Special protection appeared on her hands. The major assumed that Yusaki had lost 50% of his mind. Hijikata prepared to attack. Yuzaki pointed out that this wasn't true because he had completed his plan by 50%. Hijikata said that when he finished them off, it would all be over. Yusaki charged at Takibana. Kioru threw a punch. Yusaki grabbed her fist. The major was taken aback. A smirk appeared on Hijikata's face. Takibana was stunned. Yusaki believed that she wouldn't be able to survive. Takibana flew out of the way. There was a severe wound on her stomach. Kaoru used the super regeneration technique. The major attacked Yusaki again. Hijikata was surprised that Takibana allowed him to cut her flesh. Kaoru attacked him from behind. Yusaki assumed that she did it to break his bones. Hijikata struck back. He considered the major's actions naive. A bright flame was coming out of his hand. Takibana flew out of the way. Yuzaki continued to throw punches. Kaoru's body was badly cut. Takibana landed on the ground. Kaoru, who was injured, tried to stand up. Kiritani was heading in her direction. Hijikata stared into his eyes. There was anger on the main character's face. Takibana asked him to stop. Zai continued walking towards him. Kaoru felt that he was no match for Hijikata. Takibana's clothes were burned. Zai noted that the major did everything she could. He asked her not to force herself. Kiritani asked her to just watch. The system alerted Kiritani to an increase in mana. Zai was holding a sword in his hands. The main character said that then she will understand what it means to jump over her maximum and use all possible potential. Kiritani was standing in front of the burning Yusaki. Hijikata was glad that he was able to get out of prison. He assumed that a lot of people came to congratulate him. Yuzaki raised his hand. He didn't think it was important because he didn't have any obligations to be Kiritani's opponent. Yusaki was standing behind him. Yusaki asked him to stand still. Hijikata noted that he had no desire to waste energy on such a pathetic worm. The main character threw a punch at Yusaki. Kiritani pointed his sword at Hijikata. Zai said that if he wanted to go through with it, he would do what he saw fit. Yusaki was taken aback. Kiritani rushed towards Yusaka. Hijikata wondered if Sho would be able to handle him. Yusaki prepared to attack. Kiritani took action. He tried to attack Hijikata. The main character used the ability Deadly Poison. Yusaki blocked his attack with a magic shield. Hijikata slammed his fist into the ground. Zai hung in the air. Yusaki held up his hand. He stated that he now understood why Takibana felt this way about Kiritani. Yusaki noted that at the same time, he sees his weakness. The main character attacked Yusaki from above. On the territory of the airport, there was a strong explosion. A smirk appeared on Hijikata's face. Zai stood waiting for further action. Yusaki was talking about how mana is very similar to a normal physical ability. Hijikata noted that in battles between hunters, mana serves as the foundation. Yusaki added that this is the difference between them. The main character put the sword on his shoulder. I hear you used to be the head instructor, Zai said. Kiritani noted that his lessons are so boring that it makes you sick to listen. A smile appeared on Kiritani's face. Sho noted that Yusaki is a bit older and has a huge amount of mana. Kiritani asked if he really thought it was something to brag about. The remains of the fire's ashes could be seen in the air. Yusaki asked Sho what he said. The main character stated that if Hijikata doesn't want to fight, then he can just go back to the cell. Kiritani ran towards him. He thought that the difference in their mana was too great. Zai swung his sword. The main character was thinking that now Yusaki is stronger than him. He thought it was because of this that Hijikata wanted to put on a show. Yusaki charged into the fight. Kiritani activated the super spell ability. Hijikata blocked Sho's attack. The main character was taken aback. He asked if Yusaki was admitting that he didn't want to attack. Hijikata said it might be true. Explosions could be heard on the battlefield. Zai stepped back. He tried to put his hand on the ground to steady himself. Kiritani noted that Hijikata is slippery. The main character is mired in doubts. He believed that if they continued, the fight might drag on. Zai jumped out of the way. Yusaki asked if he was deflated. Kiritani suggested that the distance should be increased. The main character kept moving away. Hijikata said that Kiritani should not think that it is so easy to escape from him. There was a huge explosion behind Kiritani. Yusaki gave chase. Sho thought about how Hijikata wouldn't let him increase the distance. He thought that Yusaki was just playing with him. 
The main character attacked from above. Yusaki asked if Kiritani wanted to play hide and seek. Hijikata gave chase. Zai became alert. Yusaki almost caught up with Kiritani. Zai knew the same thing was going to happen again. A smirk appeared on Yusaki's face. The main character was thinking that as soon as he tries to get closer, Hijikata uses his body to speed up. Kiritani concentrated the mana flow all over his body. He knew that he only had one chance. Zai's sword was covered in mana. Kiritani believed that he needed to put all of his mana into this strike. Around Yusaki, everything started to turn into fire. He asked if Zai had closed his eyes. Hijikata suggested that Kiritani strongly wants to become Ash. The main character swung his sword. Kiritani thought about using Yusaki's habit of jumping forward without thinking. Zai was ready to attack. He believed that at this point, he would hit him on the head. There was madness on Yusaki's face. He declared that power is a blessing. Hijikata noticed that Sho was using her for the sake of some people. Yusaki considered it a pity. Kiritani impaled Yusaki's head with his sword. Zai froze, waiting. Part of Kiritani's sword flew away. Hijikata's head was on the ground. The main character was taken aback. Zai fell to the floor. The system notified him of multiple level increases. Kiritani said that he was very tired. He noted that he hadn't fought like this in a long time. The system notified Zai of receiving a new ability. Kiritani hadn't expected this. The plot takes us back a few minutes. The flames engulfed almost the entire airport. Blood splattered everywhere. Yusaki was smitten. The young man asked the stranger if he had seen or heard it. There was a duel in his eyes. The young man said that people who were not chosen end up here, he considered it fate. The boys were sitting on a tree branch. The stranger suggested that he shouldn't have told him what he knew. The young man thought that he was useless. He believed that they needed to get rid of useless people. The young man's gaze was directed at Kiritani. He didn't know who it was. He noted that Zai was weak but reliable. The main character was sitting on the wreckage of the airport. The young man claimed that he didn't have much mana. The boys joined hands. The boy informed them that they had to go. A mysterious aura appeared around them. He noted that they are already expected. The stranger stated that they needed to be told everything they knew in great detail. Lightning flashed brightly in the building. Lightning covered almost the entire building. The guy grabbed the zipper with his bare hands. Aoki thought that she needed to control her lightning bolts like threads. A loud scream rang out in the building. Sora was standing behind the main character. She asked if she would get stronger. Kiritani said that after a few attempts, she will succeed. Aoki watched the violent explosion. A smile appeared on Zai's face. He was interested in this. Kiritani noted that this is not for him. Sora was taken aback. She thought about how she should focus all her lightning bolts on one point and release them. There were traces of her lightning bolts on the floor. Aoki was thinking that she had failed again. Aoki's eyes were fixed on the news tablet. The news anchor reported that reporters arrived at the scene at Hainda Airport last night. The host noted that they were trying to contact the hunter who defeated Hijikata Yusaka and saved the Prime Minister. Sora saw Kiritani there. Many reporters tried to find out from him what happened on the scene. The news anchor stated that the savior was Kiritani Sho, who had five abilities when awakening. He noted that the reporter Yoshida managed to get a couple of comments from the hunter personally. There are rumors that you have surpassed Aoki Sora, so what do you think? Yoshida asked. A smile appeared on Zai's face. Kiritani stated that it was impossible for him to surpass the huntress Aoki. Sora was drinking a drink. The main character noted that he was still too weak. Aoki clutched the glass in her hands. Sora picked up her weapon. She wanted to focus her lightning attacks. Aoki went to train. Sora believed that she would definitely be able to complete this task by the end of the day. We watched the crystals floating in the air and the secret door. The woman leaned her head on her hand. She asked me what it was this time. The woman wondered if she had mentioned that they would stop the meetings for a while. There was a man in front of her. He informed her that the twins had found a problem person. The man noticed that the problem person has mana control and was able to use her spells. The stranger crossed his arms. He asked how many times they had traveled the world because of such words. The stranger didn't understand what the twins were doing there. The man was sitting on a chair. He said that he used the twins to test the new development. The man noted that they found it by accident. The guy said that he would not participate in this. Problem person or not, it's too energy consuming, he continued. The guy's body was covered in a magical aura. 
He noted that if a man is worried about this, he can get rid of it on his own. The woman put her hand to her face. She said that 50 years had passed since then. The woman noted that people have become better able to control their mana. The woman added that now not only they can release it, the crystals gave off a glow. She reported that Hijikata was one of them. Their chairs were in a circle. The woman said that the same thing happened 11 years ago. She noted that the person, which left a gap, was another coincidence. The stranger turned his head in her direction. He asked her if she thought the same. The hooded guy said that everything was fine as long as they had the information. The guy held up his finger. He noted that he has a lot of time. He thought it was worth a look. The eagle decided that it was too energy consuming, so it will just let the person get away with it. The guy continued. The man put his hand on the table. He asked the guy if the mask had crushed his brain. The guy spread his hands. He said that things had been too quiet for the last few days. He was curious about the swordsman. A sword was drawn in front of us. The guy noted that if what the twins saw was true, he was upset about it. A grin appeared on his face. The guy noted that in their world he is doomed to a miserable existence. He added that his limit is very clear. The major held a mug in her hands and watched the news that was playing on the TV. The news anchor reported that in recent days, Kiritani C has received a lot of attention. The host pointed out that Zai is a newbie who has gained five abilities upon awakening. Kaoru suggested that Kiritani was making a public image of herself. Takabana noted that people only see what they want to see. The major said that if she made a good impression from the start, they would raise her up themselves. Kaoru placed her mug on the table. The main character raised the mug to his mouth. He asked if Takibana was okay. Kiritani noticed that she looked very distracted. Zai's face was troubled. He asked Kaoru to clear her head of unnecessary thoughts and not wonder if it was necessary or not. Takibana was upset. The major put her hand on the table. Kaoru said the country needed them to eliminate the criminal who terrorized it. Kiritani took a sip of his tea. He asked if it was necessary. Takibana's face was quite serious. Kaoru reported that this is what the Hunter Control Department employees do. On the table was a package with a broken phone. Takibana asked if Sho could restore it. Kaoru wondered if Kiritani had followed her to find someone who was related to Maki. The Major stated that since Zai had provided them with proof, they would not dig further into the case. Kaoru placed her hands on her feet. Takibana reported that they wanted Sho to join the Hunter Control Department. A smile appeared on Kiritani's face. Kaoru noted that they will support his efforts and provide all the necessary equipment. Also, the Major added that they will give him the best conditions that the control department has ever seen. The protagonist thanked Kaoru for the nice words, but he didn't think the offer was that exciting. Zai was holding a mug in his hand. Kiritani thought that people like Jaoshima or Toyama would be happy about it. The sun was shining through the cafe window. The Major was taken aback. She didn't know what Kiritani was talking about. Suddenly, Takibana understood the gist of Sho's words. A memory of Jaoshim Toyama popped up in her mind. She thought that Jaoshima's deadly poison ability and Toyama's cancer of death acid ability were the same as Kiritani's publicly stated abilities. Kaoru was shocked. Don't tell me you can sneak abilities, Takabana said, surprised. The main character put his finger to his mouth. He noticed that Kaoru was too loud. Kiritani added that now Takibana should understand why he didn't want to explain. Zai asked if the Major would like to be the next snack. Takibana was amazed that Kiritani could steal other people's abilities. There was confusion on her face. Kiritani thanked her for her understanding. Sho placed his hand on Kaoru's shoulder. He asked for her forgiveness as he had another appointment. Kiritani added that he would look forward to working with her again. It was getting dark outside. The system notified the main character about his current stats. Kiritani was thinking about the appearance of the results of long-term consumption of the soul capsule. Zai understood that he could become stronger without relying on leveling up. Kiritani studied his abilities. Executioner heretics, why heretics? Zai continued to think. Kiritani thought that there must be a reason for this. Igawa half rose from the bed. Zai was sitting directly across from her. He asked how Iri was feeling. Igawa informed him that he needed to go through a couple more tests. Iri mentioned that she would be able to cure her mana allergy. The sun cast a shadow over the hospital. Zai asked if it was because of the rift. Igawa assumed that was the case. Iri noted that since that day, she has been recovering very quickly. The main character thought it was very bad. There was a glow all over the ward. 
Kiritani was holding a box of soul capsules in his hands. Zai assumed that Eri didn't need them anymore. Igawa asked him to wait. She noted that she will gladly accept anything that Kiritani wants to give away. Igawa put the soul capsules in her mouth. In his mind, Zai wanted Ren to be able to see how energetic Eri had become. Igawa continued to devour the capsules. Kiritani asked if Eri wanted anything else. Igawa thought for a moment. The lights were on in her room. Eri has stated that she wants to become a hunter. The main character said that it was too dangerous. Igawa raised her fist. She stated that this does not mean that she will not be able to become one. A memory of Ren popped into her mind. Iri was thinking of the world her brother wanted. Igawa's body began to emit mana. Iri noted that she wanted to see it for herself. The main character was taken aback. He was surprised by the appearance of mana. Suddenly, Zai's phone rang. Iri said it was true. The man started talking to Kiritani. He noted that a lot of time has passed. The man introduced himself as Tamura from the Hunters Association. The main character was holding the phone in his hand. Tamura said that he was calling him because he had information for him, and he asked if Sho had a free minute. Igawa raised her hand. Kiritani waved a hand in her direction. He assumed he was imagining things. Zai said he was free. Tamura pointed out that in fact, due to the recent incident, the association decided. The story takes us a month later. The boys were standing in front of the underpass. Shin was angry. He didn't understand why everyone was so free this year. In his hands, Kishida held a phone that said about the first X-rank hunter who might soon be born in Japan if he really defeated Hijikata. This is a real born hero. Hijikata has been in prison for eight years, right? I heard that he was completely neutralized, even walking with difficulty. I shouldn't say this, but the president of the association was a rank when I put him in jail. They think he has a rank of at least S. If all this happened for the sake of the show, it will be sad. Shin closed the message. He asked if Kiritani was angry that they were saying such things about him. Zai was holding a phone in his hand. Kiritani noted that he is much more concerned that Kishida is still at the C rank, even though he is teaching him. The main character suggested that he makes Shin do little. Kishida noted that we look at this subjectively. Shin added that for a novice hunter, it develops very quickly. Kishida stood contentedly with his weapon in hand. Shin stated that there is not a single hunter who has grown so fast in a few days. The main character continued to stare at the phone. He asked Kishida not to compare himself to others. Kiritani noted that if Shin gets conceited when comparing himself to others, he will never grow up. The guys were standing in front of the bus stop. Shin tried to contradict him. Sho wondered what else Kishida would say. Shin was taken aback. Kishida was curious about what the association wanted from Kiritani. The sun was shining brightly outside. Zai said he didn't know that. He assumed they would find out if they went. Tamura waved at the boys. He noted that he and Kiritani had not seen each other for a long time. Kishida was very surprised. The main character was surprised that it was he who met him. A smile appeared on Tamura's face. We decided that it would be better if you were met by someone you already know, Tamura said. He suggested that Zai go, as the president was waiting for them. Tamura folded his hands behind his back. The shadow of the sun beat back on the building. The man placed the mug of tea on the table. He apologized for making Kiritani come all this way. The man put a hand to his chest. He said that he is Wakamatsu Kenzu, president of the Japanese branch of the Hunter Association. Shin bowed his head in respect and announced his name. The main character introduced himself. Out of embarrassment, Shin put his hand to his head. Kenzu noted that Kishida had quickly become stronger recently. Wakamatsu added that if Toru were still alive, he would be proud of Shin. Kishida asked if Kenzu was doing well. Wakamatsu held out his hand. Kenzu said that he would be very happy to meet his friend's grandson, but since he had invited the most famous newcomer in town, he couldn't afford it. Zai's eyes were fixed on the tablet. He asked if it was his rank in question. Wakamatsu revealed that they had upgraded his rank to A. Kenzu noted that it took longer than he thought. Wakamatsu wanted to take a sip of tea. Kenzu said that the people who talked about him in the association were too inexperienced. Wakamatsu noted that such a rapid rise in rank is an unusual case. He added that even Aoki Sora took a year to reach the A rank. The main character was taken aback. Kiritani believed that he was worthy of the rank of S. Zai noted that he was ready to provide evidence. Kenzu put a hand to his chin. He didn't think Kiritani was particularly happy about it. 
Wakamatsu informed Kiritani that he couldn't advance to S rank with just basic abilities. We were shown Aoki Sora. Kenzu noted that only those who have proven their strength are worthy of this rank. Wakamatsu announced that he wanted to make an offer to show. The main character turned his head towards Kenzu. He asked him again. Wakamatsu said that because of the Raymer Maze incident, it became clear that dungeons can change randomly. Kenzu noted that the association took this into account and added ranks to most of the dungeons. We were shown a crowd of monsters that swarm the dungeons. Wakamatsu added that based on this, HI's dungeon acquired a gap classification from S to SS rank. Kenzu stated that according to the scouts, all the monsters in the dungeons are like defenders. Wakamatsu noted that the scouts think so because of the fact that the monsters were not affected by guns. Kiritani was holding a clipboard in his hands. He was thinking about the fact that there was a core hidden in this dungeon. Zai suggested that this is a type of fault. Kenzu's gaze was fixed on Kiritani. He said that the Council of Europe can help them in this. Wakamatsu asked if the main character would like to join the investigation. Kenzu noted that the result could be proof of his abilities. Kiritani asked if Wakamatsu felt that he was treating the newcomer too well. It was almost cloudless outside. Kenzu asked Sho not to try to deceive him. Wakamatsu assumed that Kiritani might not know this, but he had been following him since the hunter exam. Kenzu stated that he was aware of Sho's increased strength. The main character put his finger on the tablet. It says here that the extermination group can only consist of guilds. Isn't there a limit on the number of people entering the dungeon? Kiritani asked. Zai half rose from the sofa. Kenzu claimed to have forgotten about this condition. He asked if Kiritani wanted to start her own guild. Zai noted that the time is right for this. Kiritani added that he needed to join the extermination team. The main character shook Wakamatsu's hand. Kenzu stated that Tamira would inform Sho about the details. Kenzu wished him luck. Kiritani thanked him. Tree branches could be seen from the building. Sho thought that he should thank Hijikata for this. He was amazed that he was given access to an s rank dungeon. Zai thought it was time for him to start his own guild. The boys were standing in the elevator. Shin asked why Kiritani suddenly decided to create a guild. Zai said he wanted to create one when the opportunity arose. The main character believed that if he was supported by the association, then now was the time. Kishida's gaze was directed at Sho. Shin asked Kiritani about the name of the guild. Zai put a finger to his chin. Kiritani felt that this was a good opportunity to attract people he had interacted with in a previous life. Zai thought about what he remembered from his previous life. There were monsters all over the continent. The plot was presented to us by the continent of Aslan. Kiritani thought of the god of Edia. The main character tilted his head. He thought that bad memories were more distinct than good ones. Kiritani started recording on his tablet. Ko announced the decision to restart. We were shown the F-rank guild reload. Shin pointed out that there were only two members in their guild. The boys started to get out of the elevator. Sho asked Kishida if anyone was on his mind. Shin held up a finger. He thought they needed a healer. Kishida noted that they are necessary for going to the dungeon. Hiller's silhouette appeared in Zai's mind. The main character believed that Hillers are irreplaceable, and it is always better to have one in the team. Kiritani said they would think about it later. Zai pointed out that Kishida didn't have to go with him to clean up the area. The sun's rays covered the entire city. Shin didn't understand why. The main character said that it is dangerous. He thought Shin had a talent. Kiritani was thinking that Kishida would be able to complete the development of the ancient dragon race master's mana spell ability Ratiel in the future. Zai didn't think the time was right yet. The sun was shining on Kiritani's jacket. The main character said that this time they will go to the s rank dungeon. He noted that he could not guarantee the protection of the tire. Zai was saying that if something unexpected happened, he wouldn't be able to take responsibility. Kishida stated that he wanted to go with him. Shin added that he won't get any stronger if he just sits back. Kishida clenched his hands into fists. He believed that he needed to challenge himself all the time. A smile appeared on Zai's face. The main character thought that Kishida had learned to say the right things. Shin touched Sho's back. Kiritani suggested that we go to the hunter's shop. He noted that their equipment wasn't good enough. Kishida asked if Sho would buy it for him. Kiritani stated that this is so because you need to take care of a talented tank. Aoki was standing in front of the store. Sora stated that she wasn't someone Sho could call out to at will. Aoki started walking towards him. The main character noted that despite her words, she came. He assumed that she had her own motives. 
Sora was wearing glasses and a mask. Aoki said that she would tell Sho about it another time. Sora asked what Kiritani wanted from her today. Sho told her that he was asked to join the dungeon clearing group in HI today. He noted that he needs an expert opinion. Sho handed the tablet to Aoki. Surprised, Kishida put his hand to his mouth. He asked Kiritani what the suspicious person was. Shin assumed she was a broker or something. Zai asked him not to worry so much. He assumed that Kishida knew who she was. Shin assumed that she was some kind of celebrity. Aoki pushed the mask off her face. Sora asked them to come with her. The main character covered his mouth with his hand to the dumbfounded Kishida. Kiritani noted that it will be problematic if others recognize her. Sora took off her glasses. Aoki said that she would show them the best places with the best things to hunt. Kishida carried a huge bag in his hands. The main character believed that they were fully prepared with the equipment. Kiritani shoved his hands in his pockets. He asked Aoki what weapons to take. Zai added that he doesn't see anything special here. Sora guessed that there wasn't a suitable weapon for Kiritani. She turned her head in Zai's direction. Aoki told Sho about the shop she always goes to. Sora suggested we go there. The signboard of this shop was made of wood. The man greeted the visitors. He was sitting in front of a large furnace. The man asked what they would order today. In front of us was Izumi Shuguru, who was the owner of technical abilities. Aoki extended her hand towards Kiritani and Shin. Sora stated that she was here to introduce the two of them. Kishida bowed to the shopkeeper as a sign of respect. The main character introduced himself to Izumi. Shugoru looked doubtful. Izumi continued his work. He asked the boys to leave. Suguru stated that even if it was Sora's request, he wouldn't sell anything to the two of them. Aoki was taken aback. There were guns all over the store. The main character said that he would also not choose a sword just because it was made by a blacksmith. Zai pointed out that the sword should be valuable in itself. Kiritani was holding a sword in his hands. Sho didn't think it mattered how arrogant Izumi was acting because it was nothing special. Kiritani added that he was expecting something super cool because Aoki recommended him. Zai was disappointed with the weapon. He put his hand to the base of the sword. Kiritani continued to hold his sword in front of him. The main character believed that this sword would break in his hands. He was surprised that Sugoru was selling it for money. Izumi flew into a rage. Sugoru held out his hand in front of him. He pointed out that Kiritani didn't have the guts. Izumi stated that if Kiritani can break this sword, she will get any item from his shop. Kiritani put his finger to the blade of his sword. Aoki was shocked. The sword shattered into small pieces. His remains fell to the floor. Izumi watched the piece of sword blade. Kiritani asked about what Sugoru had said earlier. Izumi turned his head towards Sho. He was shocked by this. In his hands, the main character held the rest of the broken sword. Kiritani asked if there were any other objections. Sugoru lifted a portion of the blade. He couldn't believe it. Kishida tried to calm Kiritani down. Sho suggested that Izumi is very limited in his work. Kiritani hoped that Sugoru was also taking his promises seriously. When talking to Aoki, an indignant Izmu pointed his finger at Kiritani. He asked Sora who the guy was. Aoki assumed that Suguru had heard of him before. Aoki claimed that he was the one who destroyed the Rift Guard. Kiritani was looking at one of the weapons. Sora reported that Sho was a rookie who broke the Rift with a single blow. Kiritani put his hand to the blade. Izumi put his hand on his head. Suguru thought that he was getting quite old. He couldn't believe that he didn't see a person of this magnitude. The main character was standing behind him. Kiritani asked them to tell them the materials for weapons that they can use. Zai mentioned that they wanted to sell Sugur the materials they would bring in the future. Izumi thought Sho was an obnoxious boy. The store's sign caught the glare of the sun. Suguru stated that he understood him, and he asked Kiritani to close her mouth and follow him. He asked Shin, who was standing next to Zai, to come too. Izumi started to open the hidden door. Suguru noted that although the promise was verbal, he would keep his word. Izumi felt that this was the price he should pay for underestimating Sho. Suguru pulled the lever. A passageway to the basement opened up in front of them. He asked them to pass. The boys started down the stairs. The entire room was furnished with weapons. Kishido was glowing with happiness. Shin asked if it was true that he could take whatever he wanted. Izumi informed me that this was the case. There were various types of swords in front of us. Sugoru asked them not to take anything that they wouldn't use. Izumi noticed that even he was thinking about it. The main character was inspecting the contents of the room. 
Kiritani thought that it wasn't all that impressive compared to the dwarves, but if Izumi was that competent, Sho understood his confidence. Kiritani's gaze was fixed on the flaming sword. In front of Zai was the Infernal Ashen Sword, which was ranked S. Kiritani believed that the sword's bonus points covered all of its disadvantages. Izumi's gaze was fixed on Sho. He asked if Kiritani was interested. The main character noted that in his quality of work, Sugoru put his hand on a piece of cloth. Izumi was talking about the SS rank Infernal Hell rift that happened 11 years ago. Suguru said that this is an effective weapon created from materials collected from the defenders. Izumi pointed out that you wouldn't even see this in a foreign country. He compared the weapon to a wild horse. The weapon emitted a bright flame. Izumi reported that the sword burns everything that comes close to it. He noted that the weapon was in one of the defender's fragments when it was discovered. The main character turned his head towards Izumi. He asked why such weapons were just lying around somewhere. Before us was the city and what was happening beneath it. Suguru told him about the Rift of Infernal Hell, which was closed only after countless attempts and innocent deaths. Izumi noted that it was a mutual decision, so no one could pick up the things left behind. The shopkeeper added that there would be no problem with the sword as long as they didn't light it. Suguru noticed that there were still a lot of different things behind Sho's back, so he asked him to take his time. The main character activated the sword. Izumi was taken aback. He didn't understand what Kiritani was doing. The sword flames covered almost the entire room. Zai said he wanted to check it out. Startled, Shuguru watched the flames from the sword. He asked if Zai had even listened to his story. Although it's only a fragment, this weapon belonged to a Rift Class SS hunter, Izumi stated. Sugoru didn't think a novice would be able to handle this. Smoke spread throughout the room. Aoki tried to call out to show. Kiritani thought about the ability he would get after eliminating Hijikata. Zai activated the SS Rank Flame Incarnation ability. In his hands was a sword. Kiritani was amazed that the ability he had acquired would be so useful. Zai believed that this fire mana felt like a living being. Flames that looked like a monster were coming out of the sword. The main character thought it was quite strong. Kiritani turned to Aoki. He asked if she had come today to ask him something. Sora was taken aback. Sho stated that if Aoki trained the way he taught her, she should be able to see the tightness of the stance. Kiritani added that she should not put any force into it. He asked her to relax. Kiritani said that the most important thing is to keep in a variable rhythm. Taken aback, Kishida leaned towards Izumi. The main character stated that since Aoki recommended good things for Shin, he would show her. Kishida was provided with a spiky web, a weapon made of grade and material. Kiritani concentrated mana in his hand. Suddenly, a bright flame burst out. Zai pointed his sword forward. Kiritani demonstrated the mana threads. Kiritani continued to hold strands of mana in his hands. He asked Aoki to change his mana lines. Just like with lightning, you need to change direction at a specific point, Zai continued. Kiritani used his mana threads to attack the unknown. You can go now, Zai added. The main character strung mana strings. Kiritani claimed that the sword was his from now on. Bright flames continued to shine around her. The guys were shocked. Kiritani considered. Suguru was pointing at the sword. He didn't understand what was going on. Flames could be seen on the tip of the sword. The main character swung his sword. After it hit, there was a strong explosion. A bracelet began to form on Zai's arm. Kiritani turned his attention to his hand. He was surprised that it was a bracelet. Zai assumed that it was some kind of top-level technology. Kiritani opened the notification screen. The system notified him that he had received an SS-ranked martial artist. Zai continued to view his ability. The protagonist assumed that his current experience activated an ability from a previous life. He was glad of that. Zai said he would take it. Aoki asked him to wait. Kiritani turned his head in Sora's direction. She noted that Zai taught her a lot. Aoki felt that one shopping trip wasn't enough to pay the price. Kiritani asked if she had any other useful information. Aoki's gaze was serious. Sora asked Kiritani to be careful about the S-rank dungeon that Kiritani was going to go to. The main character was taken aback. Sho asked why Aoki was suddenly telling him this. There was excitement on Sora's face. Aoki stated that there are many hunters who don't like Kiritani. She noted that the dungeon is isolated from the outside world. Sora added that many hunters are greedy and vengeful. We were shown unfriendly hunters. Aoki felt that Sho should be more careful with high-ranked hunters. 
Sora informed them that their guild would also be participating in the event, and asked them to let them know if they needed any help. Kiritani closed his eyes. He said he could handle it on his own. There were various weapons around them. Sora felt that for someone who had single-handedly eliminated Hijikata, she was showing too much concern. Sora added that they would see each other in H.I. The plot takes us to a few days later. The main character was in the Cradle of Magnus, an S-rank dungeon called H.I. Province. A portal was opened in the dungeon. Shin set the bag on the ground. Kishida was unpacking things from it. Shin was worried that they were in a ranks dungeon. Kiritani pointed out that if Kishida followed him, there wouldn't be any problems. Zai added that the atmosphere in the dungeon is strange. Kishida started setting up the tent. The main character believed that even professionals were probably nervous about going to dungeons of this rank. Kiritani said that if they start freaking out on each other, as Shin said, then everything will be for the best. Kishida was holding a tent mount in his hands. Shin was taken aback. He noticed that they were being stared at by other hunters. Some of the hunters were whispering behind them. Kiritani thought that Aoki wasn't worried for nothing. Zai believed that they would add to their problems.